hello and welcome back to another live ranking video so we've done this for the heroes and now we are gonna dive in and rank every single villain in marvel champions i did not realize that we had so many so i well when i uploaded the images we have 36 here are villains in marvel champions honestly if i had to guess i would have said like 20 i i don't know why it was 30 like why i thought it was so few but we have a lot more than what we thought hey josh how's it going lurky lurk hope you're doing well bb hey nelson hope you're doing well i am hope you are doing fantastic bb maddie so what sort of criteria are we using to judge them all and so these this is going to be my how much i enjoy the different heroes my different ranking or my different tiers the top tier is going to be love killing them these are going to be some of my probably i'm going to limit these this to five so that's what i did with the heroes and so five can make it into the love killing them tier because i absolutely love getting them to the table and then just playing them over and over and killing them next tier down is going to be always excited to get them on the table the middle tier is these are just villains in the game they happen to exist uh fourth tier only play of randomly selected and then the last tier is i'd actually like to kill them so i like killing or i love killing them to i'd actually want to kill them and so we'll see where some of these rank and i think well i think there's a huge discrepancy in these heroes right because the fact that i didn't realize that there were 36 of them and i i'm counting encounters so like I did not count tower defense as two villains or wrecking crew as four villains. That's one encounter. And so the fact that there were 36 means that I don't play a lot of them frequently, which probably means that there's going to be some of these in the lower tiers and it's going to be a little bit more of a spread. Hey, giddy giddy QC. Thank you so very much for the subscription with prime. I appreciate it. Hope you're doing fantastic. Thank you very much. BB can't wait to see where the galaxy's most wanted villains right at the top. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I love it when I can kill them. How about that? That's uh... a <laughs> uh, we'll see. The galaxy's the galaxy's heroes are notoriously difficult, and I don't think I've been super quiet about how much I dislike them on the channel. Thank you, Giggity. Okay, so the way that we're gonna be doing this is we're gonna go we're gonna be going through chronologic order in terms of release. I will be flipping back and forth between Hall of Heroes and our tier maker just like that so that we can all be on the same page. And there's a lot of things that I will forget. I, I I'm really happy that I did this last time flipping back and forth because there's some things with some of the heroes or some of the villains that i don't play a lot that i kind of forget and then flipping back to hall of heroes just to kind of take a look and see what all is going on does help uh refresh all of that stuff so hey zanzer how you doing i'm doing fantastic it's friday it's always exciting to be uh streaming on a friday i'm i'm, I'm excited to talk about villains because i think villains I, I've said before that I love heroes. I'm happy that we have so many heroes. And villains is something that I would probably want more of. Now, I did not... When I said that, I didn't realize that there was... I think I did that after... I don't think any new heroes have come out. So there's only five more heroes than there are villains. But there's a lot of... There's a lot of villains in this game. Maddie, we're assuming that we're playing these villains with the recommended modulars. Yeah, Yes. So that that's a really good question and something that I need to be a little bit bit agnostic to. And so I'm hoping that I can think about them as a villain and not necessarily the entirety of the encounter with the recommended modular set. I think the modular set is a different discussion. And so Maybe maybe as we're going through and talking about them, we can talk about some of the mod sets that I like playing with them. Maybe it depends. There are 36 of them. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'll talk about some of the mod sets, but I'm going to try and rank them agnostic to the recommended mod sets. However, I will take into consideration the required mod sets. So, like, Hydra Patrol is required for Taskmaster, so I consider that part of Taskmaster, Right. Where you can use that mod set and other things, you have to use it in Taskmaster that we will be talking about Taskmaster or Hydro Patrol and Taskmaster. Okay. So yeah, without 
Xanzer, I'd love to hear what mod sets increase Osborne's difficulty. Oh, I'm sure there are. Uh, talking about the Norman Osborne, the, the flipping, not mutagen formula, but risky business. Yeah, there's definitely some. I mean, you can you can go a little crazy with some of the mod sets that we've got now. And I I haven't played Norman in a while. I, I want to I, I need to get him back out onto the table. Alrighty. Let's talk about our first villain, which is Rhino. Rhino is the core villain. People say that, you know, you want to test your decks out against Rhino. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think Rhino in a solo situation or solo encounter is a little it's very difficult. I think I think Rhino is a difficult villain in solo just because of his low threshold. So He's got a lot of attack, very low scheme. However, this break-in, threading out at 7, basically means that you cannot roll down with any sort of security whatsoever. Um, M Maddie, I mean, to be fair, you could just look at the villain-specific encounter cards. Then some villains have mandatory modulars. Yep, exactly. Yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's what I plan on being, doing. Um. <laughs> Josh, pretty much any of them make them harder since Goblin gimmicks is so easy. That's fair. That's very fair. <laughs> so Rhino, Rhino's biggest issue for me is the low threat threshold of seven per player. When you're playing with multiple people at the table, that issue goes away. But seven is very, very difficult, especially when you have some like three, especially when you... it. it it's just such a feel bad, and the game can be so over so very quickly if you like roll down, advance, and you can lose, right? Because thresholds at seven. If you're at zero, you flip down, you go to one. You probably you you have some acceleration tokens. Actually, you don't. I mean, but your mod said if they have acceleration tokens, you're gonna probably be running into advances. So it, it's just I I don't actually like. Um, I don't actually like Rhino that much just because of that. And his, he's not got too high of health. He, he's a good first encounter. He's a short encounter. He's talking about, um, he's a good first encounter. He shows a lot of aspects to the game. He's, he has a couple of guard minions, but he's just not someone that I'm excited to go back to. <laughs> oh, Rhino, always a soft spot for the very first villain, right? So we're talking about too low of a threshold. What's better, maybe eight or nine threat? I, hmm, good question. I honestly think that it would be much better if we went to something that was like a four and four. Now, I understand why they did it where there's only one set, uh, or there's only one main scheme, like it reduces the complexity of that first villain, but having one scheme and th and thwarting out so easily on that first scheme is very tough. Yeah, Sandman at nine feels about good. Also, you're bad at lurking. No, you're fine. <laughs> uh, Nathan, thirty minutes ago, I went to Alter Ego with one threat and lost. Yeah, exactly. It, it's so swingy and it's so difficult in multiplayer. That does go away a little bit. Um, Diamonds. The only thing that Rhino does is teach the boot is teach the boost abilities. And counter cards do not have boost abilities. Bomb scares doesn't have either. Interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, like a, a very like simple, easy first encounter or first set. Um, Zanzer. I like Rhino encounter, but I've always played him too much doing showing people the game. Yeah. 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 I. Yes. I played Rhino so much starting this game because I thought that he was the the perfect intro and everything and I pro I think I played him multiple times with every single core box hero before I ever moved on to Claw and I think that's what a lot of people do and I think Claw probably has a better introduction to the game it's a lot harder but it is a better introduction and shows a little bit more well-rounded um but yeah to go back I think nine would have been really nice or if they wanted to keep it at one threat or one scheme card if they went to to a 4-4 probably would have been not good <laughs> but a 4-4 could have been a little bit better or a 3-5 or something like that 
that if you roll down and you don't advance out, you're probably, you may be fine, right? So a, mm, a four four, you would you would you would scheme out on a roll down, right? You would add one scheme, bo average boost of two. You would scheme out. So if I, I, there's a couple of things, but okay. So let's go back over to our tier maker. Rhino, our first one here is, I'm going to put him in the only play I've randomly selected. I still think that I would play him. I don't hate him. I like what he did for the game, but I've just played way too many times and just lost too many times on a random boost or a random advance or a random loss that it's it's gotten to be a feel bad at this point. So I am not a big fan of Rhino. I actually don't know the last time I played Rhino now that I'm thinking about it. Um... It was pro my guess is it was probably a solo Champions League game. That'd be my guess, but Alrighty. One down. 35 to go. Luckily, I think they get a lot more interesting after Rhino. Up next in the box, we have Claw. So the suggested pairings of Masters of Evil. Claw is unique because he gets that zero attack in stage one, and then he goes to a one-two, but he does resolve two different boost cards whenever he attacks. So the variance in Claw is a lot. I, I will say that, but it also kind of makes it a little bit more fun. Um... <laughs> so many consistency in theme too. Why are Hydras running around? Oh, for um, for um, the the bomb scare for Rhino. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, I'm gonna the chat's a little off. Cool. Yep. So Claw. Claw, I think, is a much better villain in the core box than Rhino is. I very much enjoy Claw. He's one of those heroes that I do go up against when I'm trying to showcase heroes in those Hero Spotlight videos because he does have a lot going on, right? So he's got a fairly decent scheme um, and then also a pretty good attack. I typically like to think of an average of about two boost icons, and that is just me on every single sit or every single encounter that there is without actually looking at it and doing any homework i typically think that it's going to be a round two boost icons and so coming at you with a four so he hits pretty hard at five and then six up here if you you can modify that with different um levels of mod set as well He's got Guard, he's got Surge, he's got the Crisis, Super, or the Immortal Claw. He's just got a lot of depth to him, which is really fun. Uh, maybe they are taking advantage of Rhino using him as a distraction. Yes, <laughs> that's my new headcanon. That's my new headcanon. There's a story you can tell amongst the core set villains. Oh, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, they're right. Yeah, Claw also has a side scheme. Uh, ready from the get-go. We got another key way for him to stall for time. Yes. Yeah, so he starts with this defense network. He introduces... Or I guess Rhino has the crisis icon. But the crisis icon here means that you cannot remove threat from the main scheme. They introduce the hinder where you're, you know, you have three that you have to go... Or I guess two plus one per player that you have to go through before you can get to the main scheme. There are multiple levels of this main scheme. There's two of them, which is a little bit safer, a little bit better. It allows you to extend the game a little bit longer. He's got a little bit higher of a health pool. So he's a 12, 18 and then 18, 22. So the little bit higher of a health pool means that you get a little bit more or Marvel Champions, allowing you to build, which I think gives a little bit better of an idea of the pacing that Marvel Champions provides, whereas Rhino is a quick game. It's almost like a skirmish game. Claw allows you to build and feels more like a normal villain. Um, I, I really like Claw. I, I think Claw is a lot of fun. I still enjoy playing Claw, and what I will say is that out of all of the... Um, villains in the core box they did they did a pretty good job for for the three that they got in there but with claw claws just always fun he's got um i i just love the extra boost card there's so there's so much like excitement and flipping over that next boost card and also it's fun because you can run protection and now that we have cards like defiance and everything that mod are messed with those boost cards or preemptive it's preemptive strike 
or the other one that I always get mixed up. The one where you get to deal damage per boost icon on a boost card. That one's really fun to run against Claw. So Claw, I really like running protection against. And so Claw also has a special spot in my heart because of that. But with Claw, we're just go back over to the tier maker. I'm going to put him over here in the always excited to get onto the table. He's just a, he's a fun one. He, he He's really cool. Um, that variance. And then also just having the game and playing the game for as long as at least I have been playing it. I still enjoy Claw. I still think that getting Claw to the table is one of those that I look for to put him onto the table, which also is really good because he's one of those that I like to test my decks out against. And so I guess that's probably good, right? <laughs> that that I actually enjoy the... Um, I actually enjoy the Claw... Um, and I like testing my decks out against him. So Claw, Claw moves up there. And then we have Ultron. Ultron is fun. Ultron is a ton of fun. I think Ultron is one of the... Mm, Ultron the ultimate. Yeah, absolutely. Ultron has the mechanic where whenever he or like basically throughout different mechanisms in ultron set he's going to be putting the top card of your deck in play as a 1-1 minion engaged with you now that that can be boost up he has a couple of these upgraded drones so each face down drone gets plus one attack and plus one hit point zanzer ultron is always a good time yeah i he does require you to probably play a little bit differently than some of the some of the other villains, but that's absolutely fine in my opinion. I I enjoy that, I like that. But the drones having them come out and deal with them, and then there's so many cards that work so well against Ultron that you don't normally get to run. Like beat them up is actually viable in Ultron, right? Because you get to deal one damage to each minion, and you get to spread that out. You got some of these advanced Ultron drones that have the 114 with guard. So you do have to kill them. And then they were replaced as a normal drone minion when you do get to kill them. So the way that the entire set activates, or the, the way that the entire set works um, with the drone mechanic is, I think, really, really cool. Um, it is a little bit of a trap because we do have three main schemes. However, once you go to five, you are on a timer. You cannot remove threat from this scheme. And I always tend to forget that. And so whenever I flip to three B, it's like, oh wait, hold on. We got, we got to work. We, we got some stuff to do. BB first time playing Ultron back when there was only one core box was the villain. I knew I was going to love this game. I think he still holds up pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, that that's yes, really good point. Yeah, hands down the best final stage in the FFG card games. Yes, leagues ahead of Devour below and Dolgador. <laughs> I like how you you censor Dolgador. Yeah, no, I one excellent point, Maddie. Yes, Ultron is the best capstone villain in a core box that FFG has. So yeah, Dolgador is I think too hard and not fun. Uh, Devour Below, I have not played as much as the others, but I don't remember enjoying it. I felt like enjoying it as much, but Ultron is one of those that I very, very much enjoy. Love playing Black Panther versus Ultron with Retaliate. Yes, yes. Oh, and the daggers. Yeah, where you get to, oh my gosh. The other thing I love is energy barriers against Ultron because you can take a hit from Ultron. He pops out a drone and then, actually, I don't quite remember that. Um, after Ultron attacks you and then, uh... Choose to either place one threat, and then when Ultron attacks you, put the top card. So Ultron attacks, take the damage, prevent one, and ping the drone with the energy barrier is just a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, yes. Amongst the FFG course, that's cute. Yes, yes, totally agree. Yes, yes. Um, oh yeah, Black Panther. Black Panther against Ultron is always fun. Oh my goodness, I, I really enjoy Ultron. I think that the difference between Standard Ultron and Expert Ultron, starting with 1-2 and then going to 2-3, is also a interesting uh, interesting way to play and messes with it. He goes to a 4 attack, which is insane, and, but you don't get as many drones, but they, are, they do get stronger, right? So it's just a really cool way to increase the difficulty without just pumping numbers up. 
Hey, Villain Theory, late joining here, but following the convo. But Ultron is so good, still fun to this day, and so unique. Always a treat when I go back to him. So many fun ways to fight him, too. Rocket can draw. Oh, Rocket. Yes, Rocket matched up against Ultron is, is awesome. Rocket drawing so many cards is incredibly fun. And bring it. Yes. Yes. That makes me... Oh, yeah. No, I did do a... I did do a rocket versus ultron i think that was one of the first expert games i streamed which which uh if you have not played a uh, rocket versus ultron go have some fun do it hawkeye ally is also working overtime thor be oh yeah i don't think i've actually ever played thor versus ultron but yeah thor getting to draw those cards every single time you engage a minion which absolutely happens when you're playing ultron Minion Collector Vision was so fun versus Ultron. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Brand stack, yes. Interrogation Room, not half shabby either. And we found a use for Interrogation Room. I, interrogation Room is like when you thwart off the main, you get to deal damage, I think. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't play a lot of Interrogation Room, but... Oh, I, yeah. Ultron, Ultron's fantastic. They're... Mm, yeah. Yeah. Ultron's really good. Huh. I need to play more Ultron. Interrogation room is defending a minion, remove one threat. Oh, okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, especially because we're only going up by one each time. So in a solo game, that that's that's really, really solid. Alrighty, let's uh let's let's rank this. I'm a, I'm I don't know if he will sit there and keep there. Um uh, Villains like Ultron and Red Skull that guarantee a card type create fun possibilities. Yes. And that's what I love about um, Lord of the Rings is there's a lot of interactions that require you to be creative in deck building. And encounters like Ultron, encounters like Red Skull, there, there are a couple other ones that we'll talk about that require a little bit different of deck building. I'm a huge fan of. I'm going to throw Ultron up in here to the love killing them, making him one of my top five villains. I, hmm. Aha, the first and last. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I had fun. I had fun making the, uh, the, the tier names. So we're going to put him at the top five. I don't know if he's going to make it. So I did my top five villains video. Um, actually, I don't remember how long ago that was. Probably four to six months or so. Um, and Ultron was not in my top five. And so I, I think right now, just talking through, going through each one of these villains right now, he's going to be in my top five, but I could see him get bumped down. But there are also a couple in that top five that, vi that video that I put out a couple of months ago that will be changing. I have changed some of my opinions on some of these villains. Ah, uh, so those are the core box heroes or heroes. Those are, <laughs> those are the core box um scenario or yeah, encounters. And after the core box, we dived we jumped into the Green Goblin encounter set. The Green Goblin encounter set was and this was before I started playing the game. I I these all these are products that came out before I picked up the game. I picked up the game right up right before galaxies came out i think it was right before or right after galaxies came out and that that was that was a rude awakening to the game by the way but <laughs> but i didn't realize that they went core box then in, right into an encounter set but that is how they they came out and then they put out the hero packs and so we've got at least that's what they have here on hall of heroes right so they went core green goblin then into cap but Green Goblin came with two different encounter sets, and I think they're both really fun. I started out liking Risky Business more. Risky Business is the first one, the first one that we're looking at, and then the other one is that mutagen formula that I think I like more now. So I started out liking Risky Business because of this cool mechanic, right? So when Norman would attack, you place one infamy counter on Criminal Enterprises instead. Criminal Enterprises... Um, over here, it comes in with two infamy counters. If there are no infamy counters, then you get to flip Norman over to Green Goblin, and then he would take damage. So when Norman would take any amount of damage, remove that many infamy counters from Criminal Enterprises instead. So he's doing this whole thing that you, your, your hero is doing, flipping from their alter ego to their villain. 
really interesting and cool idea. I think that's awesome. Um, BB says, depends on what part of the world you were in. We got Captain and Miss Marvel just before Green Goblin. Oh, okay. In the UK? Got it. Got it. Cool. Yeah, I... I, I guess at that point there were five heroes and three villains, so I can I can see why they would put out more villains first or right at the same time. But now now we're kind of seeing some of those scenario packs either come in the middle or towards the end of some of these cycles. But um, but yeah, so you're you're flipping over into Green Goblin. Whenever Green Goblin gets flipped up, you get he does like surprise damage. So it's three, four, and then four damage. It becomes. Um, indirect to direct when it goes to expert um when and then whenever he would scheme remove one madness counter so this criminal enterprises flips over to state of madness whenever that depletes um then you flip him back over to norman and then you have to work to get him back over to green goblin in order to deal the damage it's a really fun puzzle <laughs> villain theory uk here too i really appreciate the time you're streaming at <laughs> awesome yeah i'm glad it worked i'm glad it works we have a uk audience here we do just finished the school run about to sit down with the coffee and chat champions nice i'm i'm excited yeah i was i, I was hoping when i switched to this time so i i i transitioned to doing content creation full-time um I should probably know this about six months ago, four months ago or so. And so I was streaming in the evenings, but then I moved it to the earlier times just because I think that it's a little bit easier for more people to join. It allows the UK uh, crowd to join at that time, as well as if you are able to join kind of in the morning, if you're in the US, then perfect. Yeah. So I do stream on in the evenings at some sometimes, but it's typically more in the mornings because... I'm also a little bit more on in the mornings. <laughs> uh, I only started playing the core box in September last year. And finally, having bought everything else, the very last thing that I have on the way is Galaxy's Most Wanted. Godspeed, my friend. Uh, frankly, I'm most excited about finally having Def Focus. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Something tells me uh, that something tells me that buy and get last with the entire card pool will now be available. Will feel very different than it did when first buying at the release. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, Death Focus is an incredible card. I love Rocket. I love Groot. I love the encounter. I'm sorry, the player cards in Galaxies. The the encounters are just not the greatest, in my opinion. But they some of them are fun. Like I I, I do enjoy Brotherhood of Badoon, the first one. But Nathan Germany from Germany as well. Awesome. We got a good we got a good crowd of UK folk here. Awesome. So risky business, I think, was a fun puzzle, but it feels kind of like you can solve the scenario. So whenever you get, it, it, it gets a little bit easier to to figure it out, right? You you can flip him over, and then you chump block and his lower health pool, right? He's got fourteen. What is that? Eighteen. Okay, so he's actually he's got a he's got some he's got some good health. And then twenty two. It just feels like he. He felt easy, right? So higher gun chump blocking is just very, very good against um, against him. And you can just never go down to alter ego, meaning that you can keep him in his madness state for as long as you need. Um, say what? Galaxies isn't the best top five villains in the game. Honest, I do feel sorry for people who got into the game around Galaxies Most Wanted. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yep. Risky business is a little too easy to game. Apps I totally agree with you, Maddie. I yes. That and that that's kind of what I'm thinking. I I really enjoyed it before I figured out how to game it. <laughs> so um and, and to be fair, I have not played this in a long time. I have I don't think I have actually played Risky Business since I switched to Expert. So I don't even know if I've actually tried Risky Business on Expert, which is kind of funny. I think the idea behind Risky Business is 10 out of 10. Yes. Yes. Um, but the execution in hindsight is, uh, let's just say it's very gameable. You just can't, you can just be safe forever. Exactly. Yes. And it, yes. Totally agree. Risky Business is a great idea and a cool mission, but it's very easily gamed, which is a shame. Yep. 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 
Oh, yep. You everyone said it already. So let's uh, let's let's go over here. You all have said it better than I could. So let's go ahead and drop risky business. He's a villain in the game. Um, <laughs> three different folks use the term game. Yes, we. You can game the system. You can you can figure out how to uh, mess with. Um, mess with it so that you're safe. I love the idea behind risky business. I just think that it it's a little easy to gamify. Gamify, I think that's the best way to put it. But it, he's a villain in the game, and be happy to play him. It's not even risky at all, right? <laughs> I do like the way that when he, when he flips up, I think that's really fun. But... That being said, risky business being a these are villains in the game. The second scenario in that box is mutagen formula. And so mutagen formula is different. Mutagen formula is tough. Mutagen formula is tough, especially an expert, right? So Green Goblin is sitting there with 16, 18, 20 hit points. If you're playing an expert, then you've he's got a lot. He's got a really solid stat line, 2, 2, 2, 3. Um Ooh, it'd be interesting if after adding the corruption token, then he schemed. That would, yeah, that would be interesting. That would be, that would be interesting. Gavi is like Ultron re <laughs> reloaded. Yes. Yep. He's all about minions, which is crazy. So he's got this uh, force response after a green goblin attacks and damages you. You have to place threat on the scheme. It goes one, one, uh, two. What is so dangerous about green goblin is when revealed to deal two encounter cards to each player so if you're playing in standard you have to have an answer to this you have to figure out how you're going to be resolving three encounter cards and the encounter cards are not anything to, to sneeze at right and then if you're playing expert it's three encounter cards to start the game which is which is tough which is tough um that deal two encounter cards clause will always give me nightmares, right? The uh, I think we did the, I think the first team up that we did, the four player team up that we did, we did against Expert Green Goblin, and I think it was like seventeen encounter cards on the last turn because we were going for a one turn kill, like we're or a one flip kill. We'd flip and try and kill the the final stage of Goblin, and it it didn't work. We left him with like just enough health that he came in, and we were resolving like seventeen encounter cards. That was a, that was expert venom goblin. I know we did green goblin as well. We did do green goblin. I think green goblin was the first one. Venom goblin is the one where we had all of them. Do we actually get green goblin down to to kill him? And villain theory. Last thing I'll say about risky business is that they've learned from it. It's more subtle, but venom is very similar. When the bell tower is ringing, you're safe as the counters protect you. Then it flips back and you're in danger. Spiral is also similar. But one side of her, you can't thwart her attack. And then the other side, you can do both. So it's a race to flip her rather than a balancing act between two forms. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I agree with you there. Expert Green Goblin versus Star-Lord is so much fun. I've never tried that matchup. I really want, I need to do that now. Just so many encounter cards. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm still recovering from Spiral Swords. Oh, my gosh. Spiral Swords hit you. So, okay. So we have a... Um, we have a two-stage thing here, and what I really like about this, this is one of my favorite parts of the entire uh, scenario, is that X is equal to the number of goblin enemies in play. And so now he's running all of these minions, right? He's got a an army of minions, and having these out there can be pretty fine, right? So a 1-1 one, one minion, letting him sit out there is probably fine. You can probably hang out. He doesn't have guard, whereas these these thralls have guard. But you can probably leave the soldiers out there and be okay until you flip to 2B, right? Um, when you flip to 2B, now you have to start taking care of these goblins. And the goblins raising the threat, I just think, is a really cool mechanic. And he's I, I really enjoy mutagen formula he's a little bit harder or he's a little bit longer of a scenario he's a little bit harder of a scenario as, as well but he's just got a lot of ways to throw minions at you which makes it for a very interesting and fun experience i think mutagen formula is so good i think i have to say i think that's all i have to say about it one of your all-time favorites nice nice yeah so let's let's flip back over to the tier maker 
We've got Mutagen Formula up next. We're gonna put throw him in the always excited to get him onto the table in front of Claw. I I do enjoy Mutagen Formula more than Claw. I actually, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it and looking at it, I don't necessarily know if there's anything that prevents Mutagen Formula from being a deck tester. I think Mutagen Formula, other than maybe being a little bit more on the difficult side. I guess like if you're playing him an expert, he comes swinging. But we may we may we may toss mutagen formula in the deck testing rotation because I I feel like I feel like he could be be out there. He does have a little bit higher of a health pool, right? 18 and 20, so it would be a little bit longer, but that's not bad. Gabi is one of those hard villains that I can't help but respect. The one time I beat him solo was tense. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Gabi is great. Gabi is a really good one. I, I'm I'm happy that I think that's one of the better one of the better scenario packs. That that first scenario pack. I think that the scenario packs are like uh Mojo is fantastic, but I've really enjoyed the um I really enjoyed the the, the goblin scenario pack. This is your most played scenario by a mile? Really? Huh. I wonder what mine is. I I wasn't I I I started keeping track and then I stopped keeping track last year and I started keeping track again. I don't know what my most played scenario would be. Maybe maybe claw. You get it out a lot. Nice. Yeah, I I need to add that one into the rotation. Maybe we have gambit or someone go against mutagen formula. That'd be kind of fun. Okay, so next up, we are diving into the Red Skull box. Red Skull, first campaign, awesome campaign box. Really like it. And the villains in Red Skull, I enjoy. I really enjoy the villains in Red Skull. The first one up is Crossbones. Um, oh, this is cool. They got the, they got boost icons here. Did they have that for the last couple ones? I don't remember seeing that, but... Crossbones with 20 boost icons. He's all about weapons, right? So he's got these, he's got an experimental weapon deck that will come out. You get them whenever you progress to the next stage of the Wrecking Crew is my my favorite. Our wreck oh wait. Yeah, you're right. Wrecking Crew is there. Yep. Okay, let's talk about Wrecking Crew. I don't know why Wrecking Crew is all the way over here. Thank you, Josh. Wrecking Crew was just after Red Skull in my lineup for some reason. So, cool. Wrecking Crew. I don't like Wrecking Crew. Um, <laughs> um, Wrecking Crew, I think, is also one of those things that was a really good idea, but loses its appeal after you've played it a couple of times. It is a little bit longer of a scenario. There's not a lot of modularity in the scenario because there are no modulars in the scenario. And it's the way that it's set up is you have the four villains. You got Wrecker, Thunderball, Pile Driver, and Bulldozer. And they are sitting up, or they have their own decks, their own schemes that all like, and then the active token is being passed around. And so it's a really interesting idea, right? It's a really cool way. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. I just thought you were going, I, I did too. I, I, so I don't know why. I don't know why it did this. I pulled all of these from, from Cerebro, and typically those are in numerical order when I uploaded them. And so when I uploaded these, apparently they just didn't. <laughs> they just didn't. Uh, Wrecking Crew was after Red Skull. Hmm. Deletes comments on Crossbones. 100% agree uh, with everything you're saying about Wrecking Crew. I've had fun with it, especially the first couple of times I played it, but now it's gathering dust. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It, it's... It was, it's a really cool idea. It's really fun. No modular sets means that it's going to be the same experience pretty much every single time. You can mess with where that, uh, uh, where that, what is, it's just called the active counter. Yeah, I was trying to figure out if they had a different name for it. But after step one of the villain place, place one threat on each side scheme, move the active counter to the villain whose scheme has the most threat. So you can kind of gamify the system a little bit. I, well, I never thought about Overwatch in this scenario. Um, I think Wrecking Crew is great, but it needs replayability. Yeah, yeah. I let me, yeah, let me say it like this. I think Wrecking Crew is very 
Cool. I think Wrecking Cool is a very interesting, unique setup. I think Wrecking Crew is a lot of fun to play. However, once you've played it four to five times, it gets samesy and it gets a little... I don't know. It, it's just, it's not there for me. I, I, one, it takes a lot to set up. <laughs> There's a lot going on. It takes a lot to set up. And that is a little sad. And however you want to think, look at that. Um, but it takes a lot more to set up. And then also you're getting that exact same scenario, that exact same, uh, experience every single time you play Wrecking Crew. So I, I'm, I'm not a fan of Wrecking Crew. Um, but it was one that I enjoyed and it's kind of fallen off the radar for me. So over here on the tier maker, we're actually going to have our first, I'd actually like to kill them just because at this point, I, even if they were randomly selected, I'd probably reroll that randomizer because I don't want to set up or play wrecking crew. So, um, one, and, and the thing that finally put me over the edge of wrecking crew was the, I, I played them in a solo champions league game playing them four times back to back and I was just like okay I'm or three times however many times you've played and then I I practiced before I started and so I played Wrecking Crew like six to eight times in like one week and I was like I'm done I'm done <laughs> I think it's prime for community customization cu community custom modifications with existing or new villains that would be cool yeah so if you had ways to swap out each of the or the different um, villains or have some way to switch it up and modify the scenario, I think we would be looking at something that's very much different than a bottom tier encounter. Alrighty, so now we can talk about Rise of Red Skull. So everything that I had said before, I really like the Rise of Red Skull box. I think it's a really cool uh, campaign. It's, a, it's an excellent first campaign. Crossbones, I like. I, I like Crossbones. I like how he scales. He goes from a 1-1 one, one all the way up to a 2-3, but that is a little deceptive just because how many weapons he gets, right? This, um, the, I wonder if, uh, it's not going to be here. I was, I was hoping that we could easily link to, here, we can do this, the mod sets. We need, here we go, experimental weapons. So, this is a side deck. You put four these four cards in a deck. You flip one of them up at the beginning of the game. Or I guess whenever you progress on through the uh, different scheme stages. And so the first one you, you flip one up. And it kind of modifies how you have to go at crossbones, right? The laser rifle giving him ranged prevents that retaliate from triggering. But also gives him a plus one attack. And so this is, becomes a 1-2, a 2-3, and then a 2-4, which gets a lot scarier. The exosuit, plus one, plus one. Random card, discard, retaliate one. There's just a lot of different ways that it messes with Crossbones. I, I really like the Experimental Weapons deck and setup. And Crossbones also... Um, benefits even more from it because he gets a piercing he gets piercing whenever he has that weapon attachment so you want to be trying to get rid of those weapons but it also is a little like the weapons depending on your deck build you could flip into one that's not too bad but it also you know now he has piercing and maybe ranged and how does that mess with the way that you're going at the scenario Crossbones is super good, Villain Theory. I think his low HP hasn't scaled well with the modern pool of deck building cards. He just turns to fall over, especially in solo. But everything about him is otherwise very good to me, especially with how customizable he is with three modular sets. Yeah, that's a, yes, I, that's a really good point. I think I'm trying to figure out if there's any, maybe maybe someone in chat knows if there's anybody that requires more mod sets. But there are three mod sets that you can mess with Crossbones and make him completely different. Um, he's got some lower scheme thresholds. It's a three, six, five, and I'm okay with that. I think that's fine. The lower hit points, 14 and 16 is a little easy to the hood. Requ oh, fair. Yes. Fair, 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 fair. <laughs> Touche. Ah, yep. Nope. Yep. Crossbone has a tail of two villains. Did you see legions of Hydra? No. Then he's, he's yes. Then you're dead. Interesting. Yeah, so Legions of Hydra is... Oh, yeah, we can... I didn't close it out. Um, 
Where are we? Oh, is Legions of Hydra in the core set? Okay. Yes, but Legions of Hydra with Metam Hydra can get very, very nasty really quickly. But I like I like Crossbones. I like what he does. I like Legions is actually from the core set. Yeah. Okay. Bummer. Oh well. Um, but Legions of Hydra can can get nasty um, with the Metam Hydra, and then also I I really like Machine Gun. I think Machine Gun adds another kind of like side to the to the villain machine gun comes out whenever you reveal stage two or if you just ever flip into it as an encounter card comes with two ammo counters when crossbone attacks you now this actually is something that i've been um playing incorrectly until recently so this is when crossbones attacks you so this actually triggers before the attack so this is another way that crossbones is messing with those tough status cards if you flip into a one boost it does knock that tough status card off um it is indirect damage so that is nice but it, i i just think that's a really cool way it's also one of those weapon attachments so it does give him piercing and so there's just a lot of ways that crossbones messes with you comes in with seven threat and a hazard oh yeah <laughs> yeah, if Legions comes out, then you uh then you look to rush at that point. <laughs> uh yeah. Crossbones is cool. Crossbones is cool. Let's go over to the uh tier maker. I am going to say Crossbones is I'm always excited to get him onto the table. I'm gonna put him in between Claw and Mutagen just because I I like what Crossbones does. There's a little bit more depth and vari variability. Um than some of the other villains. He's also one of those that I like to test decks out against. I think he works really well to test decks out against, especially with how much you can modify the encounter with the three encounter set or with the three mod sets. So get stuff with crossbones, starting it off strong. But don't worry, we will we will hurt those uh, good feelings with absorbing man. <laughs> absorbing man is the second villain in the red skull campaign i like what absorbing man does for the campaign right where you're adding these delay counters on the main scheme and then that comes back to mess with you later i think it's actually in the red skull absorbing man absorbed all the fun <laughs> yeah 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 absorbing absorbing man is i think one of those villains that they had interesting ideas and they learn from him, right? So Absorbing Man is really easy. He's got a low health pool, and then he schemes out a 12 per player. He, he, it's, Absorbing Man's very easy. I'm actually, I wonder, Absorbing Man probably is in, maybe, maybe one of the easiest villains in the game. But, like, he has, he has the cool mechanic of having these environments. So the wood, ice, stone, and metal traits. And then based on what trait he has, um, then you get different. And then encounter cards deal different things. So like the steel cake, when revealed, alter ego, place two threat or three threat if he has the metal trait. And then there are things like Omnimorph duplication, where if Absorbing Man has whatever trait he has, something happens. And then he has his super absorbing power, which gives him all the traits, which can be very, de very, very dangerous. You get that on stage two, so you want to really want to quickly get rid of that. But again, just you know, thirty-one health in an expert game, you can you can steamroll over Absorbing Man. He's only ever scheming for two, and it yeah, I don't know. Absorbing Man, I think, does a good job of delaying you in the campaign, but from a uh, from a individual standpoint. I'm gonna throw him in the actually. I'd actually like to kill him in front of in front of Wrecking Crew. I still would like to play Absorbing Man more than Wrecking Crew, but Absorbing Man just doesn't have enough depth to make him interesting, in my opinion. He absorbed all the fun. <laughs> oh, my mouse is about to die. Hold on, let me find a. I've got too many cords on my desk, so. Is that the same with everybody else? Just cords everywhere? <laughs> okay. Now, let's go over and talk about the third villain in the campaign, which is Taskmaster. Taskmaster, I 
I really like Taskmaster. Taskmaster was in my top five for my initial video that I did a couple months ago. Taskmaster is a lot of fun. Um, he has these ca captive heroes, the, the Moon Knights, Shang-Chi, White Tiger, and Elektra, where you can get these allies if you take down the Capture by Hydra side scheme. So you can, you're hoping for those Capture by Hydra schemes to come out. Um, <laughs> uh, Jester Sack, only seven cords at the moment. Okay. Yeah. I have more off my desk, but that's kind of, that's because I cheated. Cause I, I, I got another table for where my computer is. And so, nope. Okay. No, I got cords back there. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you get to, you, yeah. So you get to hunt down these, uh, captive heroes using the capture by Hydra in this, in the campaign you get to keep the ones that you rescue the allies are very powerful they have a win entering or actually sorry they have a when you play them ability and so there's the attacker the thwarter uh the all and then the all around good all around decent moon knight's probably my favorite over here especially now that we have access to a lot more wild resources they're all zero cost but then they have a kicker that if you pay for them with a specific resource you get more stuff um, I like Taskmaster. He has a penalty for rolling down because whenever you change to hero form, you take ender or you take damage, uh, based on the number of boost icons when you flip back up. And I, yeah, Taskmaster, I, I, I really enjoyed Taskmaster. I think one way or another kind of killed Taskmaster a little bit though. Um, villain. Taskmaster is really fun. My only negative is that the allies are so good and cheap that they make it a bit too easy for your liking. That's only become an issue when I got better at the game. Love everything about him otherwise. I think the idea of punishing you for changing form in a way that isn't just a threat related is cool. Absolutely agree with you on that one. Yeah, his, his threat threshold is really high. You're probably not scheming out super frequently with Taskmaster, but that is offset a little bit because of how much threat you want to be removing on these side schemes, right? The other thing that I think they probably could have done is instead of having this as a five, putting it as like a three hinder two or something. So where it comes in as five in a solo seven, nine, 11, because this five is really easy to take care of in a multiplayer game. I guess there is more that you have to do. And so the allies are less valuable in a multiple player in a multiplayer game than they are in a solo game. But this five, I mean, when these come out, you can really easily take care of them, get the capture by Hydra. But uh, I think what I was saying right before is that the um, one way or another is absolutely broken in Taskmaster, right? Because you can go find the capture by Hydras. You can easily thwart down because you're playing Justice. And then you get that cap that ally. And one way or another is is playing with cheat codes with Taskmaster. Now it's very fun cheat codes. I, I really enjoy that, but um, I, I do like what some of the, or like what Project Wide Awake did to kind of put its own twist on this. With Taskmaster, I, I really enjoyed Taskmaster. He was my number five when I did my initial, uh, my initial top five. He is gonna be bumped out. So Ultron was not in there in my top five. When I made that, Ultron is now in my top five. I think I have a better appreciation for what Ultron and what Ultron does now. And so Taskmaster, we're going to actually throw him at the top of the always excited to get to the table list and call it there. So he's not in the top five, but he's he he, he skirmishes for that spot with, with uh, a couple of heroes. Cool. So if we had... Uh, if Ultron and Mutagen formula is Ultron Reloaded, then our, the fourth hero in the Rise of Red Skull is Reloaded Extreme. I don't know. Zola is a crazy minion scenario. He has all of these Hydra mutants that have some crazy attachments that make them insane. Zola! <laughs> is that a is that a excited Zola or a not excited Zola. Um, 
I don't love Zola. I don't I don't really like Zola. The Retaliate one is frustrating to me more so than it is challenging. I I don't like printed Retaliate, but that's just more my playstyle than whatever. Excited excited and mildly scared. Yeah. Zola can be insane. I have not played Zola since I learned the rule that counters go away when you progress the scheme. And so like all so whenever you resolve step one of the villain phase, you place one test counter here. And then if there are three or more test counters, discard cards until you get a minion, remove three. And so you are placing these and you're going to be consistently getting minions. Do you want, do you want meant to like him or you're meant to beat him down? You, <laughs> do, uh, you aren't, oh yeah, you're not meant to like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, but I, I never learned that the Zola counters or that the test counters went away, but that does make the scenario a little bit easier. But these quick strikes, the Zola mutates, I think it's a really interesting scenario. Um, villain, since Zola gains one counter per turn and gains a minion when he gets to three, it's a lot harder in solo. Much easier for four people to deal with one extra minion than one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've ever really thought about that. I don't know if I've ever played. That's probably not true. I think I streamed with Jason, D20. I think I streamed a Red Skull campaign with Jason. But I, other than that, I don't know if I've ever actually played Zola outside of a solo game. Um, it's also not true because play, I've played with uh, three players through a campaign. I like the idea of the different attachments for the minions. I think we've started to see a lot more of those in recent sets and he's got these mind rays which are just brutal right so zola schemes in alter ego or he attacks you and throws a status card on top of it just oh oh yeah hydro prison i thought was i thought is a really interesting mechanic i totally forgot about hydro prison so at the start of the game you reveal hydro prison i believe it's at the start Searching counter deck and for Hydra Prison. Yep, 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 yep. So the Hydra Prison, when it when it comes in, um, you take your signature ally and throw it under uh, the Hydra Prison, and you add threat equal to the cost of that ally. So it's a way to kind of rescue your signature ally, which is pretty fun. But um, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go tier maker. We're gonna have. A Zola coming in and only play if randomly selected in front of Rhino. Um, I like the idea of Zola more than I like Zola. I feel like that's a lot for... <laughs> I think I'm a bad person. If your signature ally is really expensive and puts a lot of threat in the scheme, I don't always rescue them. Oh, no. I Yeah, it's it's definitely a, it's a very valid choice in a lot of situations, right? There's a couple of... Yeah, so... There's a couple of heroes now that don't have signature allies, and I don't think there were... I guess Hulk didn't have one, right? Hulk came out. Um, there's there's a lot of... There's, there are a couple more heroes now that don't have those signature allies, which... Or they have signature allies that are not super relevant or don't necessarily need to be relevant, right? So, like, if you're running through with Quicksilver and... Scarlet Witch, if you're running that as a two-team two duo, you throw their signature allies, which are each other, which are unplayable no matter what. And so now you've made your deck better. Had to take a call. Zola that low? He's hard, but I quite like him. I, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I find Zola frustrating. I find Zola frustrating more than interesting. Um, I, yeah. The, the Retaliate is tough. The, the minions are tough, but... Groot, Rocket, and Venom don't have allies. Yeah, and then Storm doesn't. Hulk doesn't. The retaliation is annoying. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yep, retaliation is annoying. Miles and Gwen. Yep, Miles and Gwen don't. Good call. Yep. It, yeah. Onboard retaliate is lame. Like onboard stal stalwart. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, we'll we'll yeah we'll talk about some stalwart villains here in a second. But Zola is there, but don't worry because up next we have Red Skull, and I really like Red Skull.
I really like Red Skull. Like what Josh was saying earlier, Jay Walton was saying earlier, Red, Red Skull or like the Ultron are heroes that require you to change the way that you're normally playing the game. The way that Red Skull is unique is he has the side scheme deck where every single turn at the beginning of the villain phase, you're revealing another side scheme. And uh, Red Skull gets bonus attack per side scheme in play. Sorry. So it, it's oh, there's so there, it's just such a fun puzzle because these side schemes are completely different. You got like the sleeper side scheme, which com brings out the sleeper, which is disgusting and horrible. But you have to kill the kill the sleeper before the side scheme can go away. The uh, yeah, you get the red house, which you can remove with attack. Prison camps allows you to get an ally. So sometimes whenever you're pulling out these side schemes, you have good benefits whenever you take care of them. Or you have, but you also have to deal with more attack. Okay, man, I fought Red Skull with the crime modular from Mojo Mania recently, and all the schemes had so much threat. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. That's the other thing that I really like about Red Skull. Because you are creating this side scheme deck. It's not like the experimental weapons where it has four set cards. It is every single side scheme that is in the encounter deck. So you can make this scenario completely different and interesting, right? My, my least favorite matchup that I've seen, which was also a solo Champions League game, was the Doomsday Chair in this scenario. So you throw the, the, the side schemes that bring MODOK out... And so you're always playing with MODOK. Or if there are side schemes that bring out Rhino, like I think are a couple of the other ones. There's a couple of other ones that bring out some of these big minions, which just throws a whole nother wrench into how you play the scenario. And Red Skull, I think, is just a really cool, really interesting way to play the game. Um... Retaliate, that's an upgrade that you can remove as a fun puzzle. Retaliate, that is baked in, just sucks. Totally agree with you there, BB. Nurse, one way or another, too, which is not a bad thing. Yes, one way or another does not work in this. Legions of Hydra is similar. Oh, yeah, Legions of Hydra. and Oh, my gosh. You could have so many just... Ah, Red Skull... Yeah, here you go. Here's a Red Skull doesn't have a Prince of Retaliate, but here's a puzzle to get rid of Retaliate, right? It is right hook. He has two right hooks, apparently. Um... But yeah, I I'm really I really like the Red Skull scenario. I I think that it's a really cool way to mess with the game and change the game. And then like just the the positive benefits for defeating some of these side schemes. If you want, uh, Metam Hydra just doesn't leave play. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, if you want to modify some of these quote, easier side schemes where you get a benefit to taking them out and like just these acceleration, you can throw in tough side schemes. I, I really like the idea of running crime. I think that's fun. I think that's fun. But I'm a big fan of Red Skull. I think that the the capstone villain in the Rise of Red Skull box is just like Ultron and just one of the top tier heroes in my opinion. So let's flip back over to this tier maker and we are going to drop Red Skull in above Ultron. I, I like Ultron... I like Red Skull more than I like Ultron. I like them both, but Red Skull just provides so much. It's just a fun puzzle. It's just a fun puzzle that requires you to flex into needing thwarting potential, but also not necessarily, right? There's another angle where if you're not thwarting down those side schemes, can you race, right? He has got 12 and 16 hit points in standard, so he's not a huge, he's not super beefy, but he'll hit you like a truck if you leave those side schemes out there. And so, like, this is... This is minimum a two one, because you're always result you're always bringing out a side scheme at the beginning two one three two three three, which is nothing nothing to be uh or something to be scared of, especially if you leave those out there and this can you know very quickly become like a three five and yeah, Red Skull when end of a campaign box villains were fun were hard but not too hard <laughs> right yes I. Yes, they, I think, nailed that, right? So Red Skull is very challenging, but he's very fun, and he does not feel oppressive. He doesn't feel like you are never going to beat this scenario. So big, big fan of Red Skull. And that is wave one. That's wave one. 
I guess I guess that's the start of a wave run. I always kind of think of Rise of Red Skull in in like the wave one genre because I kind of all bought them at the same time. But we do have probably one of the most interesting villains next. Kang. I like Kang. I think Kang is really interesting. I I like I wish I play Kang makes me want to play more multiplayer games. Kang is really cool because it's a uh, it's like Foundations of Stone for Lord of the Rings. Josh, maybe maybe you can correct me on that. I want to say Foundations of Stone, but it splits you up in a multiplayer game. So there's three stages that you have to fight in Kang other than just two. So you you start on one, then you go to stage two where you have um, different like all or different realities. Kang is the master of time. He can manipulate and throw you in different dimensions. Cool. Yes. Nice. Foundations of stone. Let's go. Thank you, Josh. Um, and in stage two, you get broken up into your separate play areas where you cannot affect the other players at the table. And once you defeat your Kang, then you get to... Uh, join another player and you work around jumping through time and thematically it's just so cool the different versions of kang are different so you know there's some zero schemes three attacks and so it's always a roll of the dice which one you're going to get which makes it really cool and really fun uh kang was the first villain that made me think this game was meant to be played two plus player and solo was a bit of an afterthought yeah yeah that yeah that's a that's a good point two yeah i i I have played Kang solo. I would not pull Kang out solo. And I do think that probably hurts his ranking at this point. When I did my initial top five villains, he was in my top five. He was number three for me. Um, but the more that I play this game solo, the more that I lean into enjoying other villains more. Not saying that I don't enjoy Kang, but just the way that I've been playing Kang. I think that Kang... Um, works better in a multiplayer setting, which I just don't have as much access to. Kang is the king, my personal favorite. I do mostly play a two-player, so that's an influence, but I've really enjoyed him solo too. Yeah, and, and in solo, he, he can be a challenge. Um, and, and really cool. I, yeah, I just, I like Kang. I, I just said that it hurt him, but I'm, I'm reading through here. I really like Kang. He's, oh my gosh. Yeah, the king's dominion. I remember that there was a big thing in in Solo League where you would just let you would just scheme out the the second the second uh, stage and just allow you to build up a little bit. Um, Kang also has forty three cards in his set. Like Kang is a, a big big uh, villain. Um, <laughs> do you play with mod sets, right? Um, yeah, temporal. Okay, yeah. I think he's fun solo, but he's definitely more fun to the four player. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a really good way to put it. Let's go back over to our tier ranking. I, you know, I said that it's gonna hurt him. I think it will. Is he's not gonna be number three? I'm gonna drop him in right behind Ultron right now. I, I, I like. I really enjoy Kang. I think Kang is a lot of fun. Um, I'm gonna throw him there. He may get bumped off. Thinking about just Ultron versus Kang, I do like Ultron a little bit more because I think Ultron requires a little bit more. I don't even know. King also requires a lot of flexibility and tactical decisions, but let's put him. Let's put him there. Let's put him there. There are here. Or there are villains that I like more than King, so he may get bumped off. But let's throw him there right now. I still think he's good solo. You get four different ways to play him. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a really really good point because top back over here because whenever you flip into a random King. You get four different second stage Kangs, which feels like a different game. There's that printed retaliate. <laughs> hmm. He's a long, he's a long scenario. He is a long scenario. There's a lot going. <laughs> Here we are, guys. The next five are top five are top seven minimum. Oh no, we have disappointment. Alrighty, so next up is Galaxies. I hear boss music. <laughs> uh, I, I like panicked for a second because I was like, do you actually hear music? Because I'm like listening to music right now, which is... 
but I, I was not putting it through to the stream or I thought I wasn't. And I was like, wait, hold on. Are we, are, do you guys hear the music? Cause now I can't use the video. I was like, oh no, but here we are. We're fine. Okay. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah. So galaxy's most wanted where I came into the game. Oh my gosh. This was demoralizing to me. I will say that we, first up, we've got brotherhood of Badoon, which is Drang. I like Drang. I, I actually do enjoy Drang. I think he's a really fun first encounter. He's got this ship command mod set that's required. And the ship command gives you the Milano, which makes you feel like you're piloting the Milano around the stars. And the Milano can be used as a wild resource, or it can be used to remove threat from different schemes. Or, in, like, it, in, it messes with the encounter set a little bit, right? So there are going to be cards that say... Exhaust the Milano, spend two resources, or do X. And so the Milano is a different resource that you have to manage. I, I enjoy the Ship Command mod set. I think it makes the game a little easy. Ship Command is a little bit easier of a mod set because it does give you that printed wild resource. But I like the idea of it. I hope we get to see more vehicles and stuff like that that modify what you can do. Because I, I really like that idea. Uh, Drang kind of has the same idea of like placing those counters on the uh, Badoon ship. So we are kind of chasing around this Badoon ship. And then whenever he schemes or after stage one, we place a charge counter on the Badoon ship. And then once we have four or more counters, we remove them and deal two indirect damage to everybody. Um, the music I hear starts like a whisper, subtle but chilling, sending shivers down my spine, and it says, you stand accused. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I have some things to say about Ronan. Um, Drang, uh, you know, I think Drang works a lot better in Expert than he does in Standard, starting with Spear, which does give him stall or right? Yeah, stalwart. Uh, starting with the spear, giving him solar, starts at a 2-4, so he does start really tough. I feel like he, like, is a really good example of how Expert makes you deal with problems right off the bat, right? Like, you can't necessarily sit there with a 2-4 villain before you've ever played a card. So you have to figure out how to get rid of it by spending either the, you know, spending a mental, physical, physical resource, and then that prevents you from building a little bit because you're spending those resources instead of playing cards. So there's a lot going on in the scenario. The, the, um, yeah, he's got a really small scenario. It's only 13 cards. And then I think it's what, two brotherhood of Badoon and ship commander required. And then band of Badoon is there. So I really like the ship command brotherhood of Badoon is good. Um, but I, I enjoy drink. I, I like drink. So, Let's uh let's go. Oh, that's the wrong button. Let's go over here. Let's go Drang. We're gonna drop Drang into the excited to get onto the table. I think I'm gonna drop him in after Claw. I think because of the ship command set, while I like the idea of the ship command set, I think ship command and Drang has started to become a little bit too easy and less exciting for me. Big Drang fan. Yeah. I guess you could always like just say like what I do with Master Mold, which I don't think I'm doing anymore, and just ignore the ship, ignore Magneto. Um, I, I really like Drang. I think Drang is a lot of fun. Uh, he's also one of those that I test my deck out against. I've kind of leaned away from testing my deck because of that Milano. The Milano can solve a lot of problems that Drang throws at you. And so, there. But Drang does throw a lot of problems at you. I'm a Drang is absolutely my favorite in this box, by far. It's my favorite in the box. <sighs> Deep breath, drink a diet, Dr. Pepper, before we start talking about these other four. Okay, Collector One, least favorite encounter in the entire game. I hate Collector One. I. Do not, I do not like collector. I am not a fan, Sam. I am. Collector one is all about trying to collect your items and get it into a collection, and it's a additional loss uh, condition. Whenever a card leaves play, it goes into the collection, and then his cards want to put things into his collection. If it ever reaches, I think it's five. Yeah, it's five in the collection. 
<laughs> PB. Wait, Dragon is eighth at the moment. When you add the other four galaxies most wanted, he won't be in the top seven. This doesn't seem right. No, we're going to work some magic. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Unanimous collector one is booty. Yeah, Josh, I concur. I, I, I like the idea of additional loss conditions. I think that's cool. I think it stretches how you need to approach and play the game. I think that's fun. I think that they cranked down and made collector way too hard collect especially in solo because you can only ever remove one card from the collection every single turn by either spending two resources or discarding uh, or exhausting your hero then you are always losing that the entirety of marvel champions the way that i enjoy playing the game i am a combo player i like to build out and collector prevents me from doing that collector is actively trying to make me not have fun with this game and I get so frustrated with Collector. <laughs> uh, Collector is S tier against Black Widow and Nebula. Yeah. And he act. Yeah. He. There. Okay. There are heroes I want to say cannot be Collector. That's probably not correct. I'm sure there are players out there who can figure it out how to beat Collector with Nebula or Black Widow. But it, it's. It's just not fun. It's just not fun. I, I just do not enjoy him. Um. You play collector one wrong for ages. I didn't play his card that could go. His cards could go into the collection. He was still challenging, but wasn't unfun. Yeah. So the collect he can collect his own cards. That's a whole nother issue of why I don't like collector. <laughs> I, I've I've said a lot right now, um, but the fact that minions go into the collection is dumb. The if it was just player cards that went into the collection, I think we would be having a different conversation right now. I still don't think I would enjoy him because I still think that only being able to remove one card from the collection every single turn is a big turn off for me for this game. I wish that this was maybe like something like a hinder because I feel like in solo, it, it you just get out of control so quickly, right? Because he's swinging at you for a three in expert mode, which means that you are going to need to chump block, which means that those allies are going to be going into the collection, which means that you're going to lose the game. And you have to either spend the resources preventing you from building or exhaust your hero, meaning that you don't get that basic activation in order to get those allies out of the collection. It's, it, I'm very frustrated. I, I've worked myself up. <laughs> I can tell that I'm like angry. Um, kind of funny you can lose the game when he only collected his own stuff. Wasn't it already his? Why is victory over? Exactly, right? Yeah, I... I, I I do think that it would be a lot better if he could not collect his own stuff. And I I love Project Wide Awake for that reason, right? Project Wide Awake is a fix on this. We will get to Project Wide Awake here in a second. But they learned from Collector. And that's the only good thing I will say about Collector. Is that I think that it's an interesting mechanic that they learned a lot from. There should be a size scheme that resets... <laughs> And has something like three or four threat every single time you defeat it, you get a card out. Yes, yeah, that would be great. That that would be a great way to do that. That would be a great way to do that. Let's go ahead and drop over here. We all know where this guy's going. He's going behind Wrecking Crew. I hate I hate Collector. I I honestly don't know if I. Okay, like the completionist side of me would be very upset if I lost Collector. But if I lost Collector, I don't think I would be too too upset. So, oh, okay. And just in case Collector wasn't. Collector 1 was enough. We've got Collector 2 because that's a thing. I, I, okay, so I like Collector 2 more. I had a very frustrating time last game playing with Collector 2. Um, I feel like Collector 1 needs his own tier called Banished to the Deepest Pit of Hell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a Shadow Realm. I need, I need to add it to Shadow Realm or something and just like, yeah. Because the deepest pit of hell, then you're starting to interact with Hella, and I enjoy Hella, so I don't even want to associate Collector with Hella. That's how much I dislike him. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Collector Collector One it was a swing and a miss, but they did learn stuff from him. If I try and say something positive about Collector One, Collector Two I think is more interesting. Collector Two is a race to get out. So instead of kind of want, needing to kill the Collector, because the Collector is immortal, he. Uh, you are thwarting down the main scheme, 
once you get to zero on the main scheme, then you get to progress. So it's a little bit, you're flipping the entire thing on its head and that makes it a lot more interesting. So like one, you start with 11, or you, I'm sorry, you start with seven, you lose if you get to 11, but if you thwart it down, you advance. And then as you're going down, you get to find the Milano, you get to, things change in the game. And I think it's a lot more interesting. I had a really bad time. I think it was Nova. I think I took Nova through the Galaxies campaign. And I had a really hard time with Nova just because of that burst potential. And he did not have a ton of thwarting or enough thwarting. Um, so I, I ended that stream or that, that like that, that campaign like in collector two, almost less than collector one. I have since gone back, looked at him. I think I like him more than what I took away with Nova. Um, I don't like when they're the same villain for two different scenarios. Wish it was a different villain and not two of the same character. Yeah. Yeah. I, f I feel like, you know, they're, they're, I think it was an interesting story that they were trying to go for, but I, I do think that it would be kind of interesting to have a different, just like a, a different villain to go at, right? Just make it a little bit, shake it up a little bit. I think that'd be cool. I actually like Collector 2 is unique as well, but doesn't make me want to flip my table and that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The best thing about Collector 2 is that he's not Collector 1. Your, your table doesn't deserve it. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I like, no. Okay. I, I, I like the fact that Collector 2 is different and interesting and just, you know, switches up how you play the game. I think that's really cool. Uh, my issue with him is that the second scheme starts at 11 threat. So you aren't ready. You can auto lose that turn. I don't think I ever, Oh, 11 to 15. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Um, yeah, so you do have to be very intentional when you're flipping those schemes. I think there's three, right? There's, yeah, there's three. And then you go to eight and you, and you, you thwart down, you thwart your way down. You have different ways to remove threats so that you don't just have to be running justice. I think that would be my biggest complaint about collector two is that it feels like it rewards the best aspect, <laughs> right? So you, it feels like you, you're, you're going to have a lot harder of a time not playing justice. Now, if you kill collector, he starts with what? Eight and 10 hit points. If you flip them, then you get to remove three threat from the scheme, but you're trading eight damage for three threat. And I don't know if that's a sustainable way to remove all of the threat throughout the entire scenario. So you do have to have some consistent thwarting. And so that could be an issue. It also, well, the other thing that I like about collector too, is that it brings in reasons to run like crisis averted and some of those huge thwarting cards into a solo game, right? So I typically am not looking to run Crisis Averted in solo, but in a two-player game, yeah, definitely. All right, in a two-player game, yeah. But in Collector 2, Crisis Averted gets a lot, lot better. Uh, let's go over here to um, the Tier Maker. I'm going to drop him in. These villains are in the game. I but He's okay. I, I, I am actively frustrated with Collector 2. But I like the puzzle that Collector 2 forces you to carry out. So Collector 2 is there. I also think that his standard is a lot better than his expert. Yeah. So just to flip back, his standard is a 1-1. One, one, and then he gets plus X equal to the main scheme's current number. So he does increase in difficulty. Collector 2 is the same thing. But whenever he flips, he still has a 2-2 instead of a 0-0. And so collect, our expert collector 2 is a lot more difficult, I think. But, but yeah, current tier list all the way through collector. Let's talk about Nebula. Nebula, I like what they did with Nebula. Just the fact that she is a minion, a ally, a hero, and a villain. Queen of Surge, or you hate it. That that's the biggest problem, right? Nebula is well, Nebula and Ronan fight for that uh monarch of Surge. And Nebula. I I really like the design behind Nebula and what they did with Nebula and how she 
mirrors herself in every single form, minion to villain to hero and to ally. She feels, well, not really the ally. The ally kind of falls apart, but like the, the other ones kind of work really well. And it's just a cool synergy across the different ways that you can play her, especially her hero to villain. It feels very much like you're playing the villain version of Nebula. Villain theory, if you get good luck with Nebula, she's fun and plays like I think she's intended to. But if you get unlucky, especially at the start when discarding for techniques, she might as well be Ronin. Yeah, she is very swingy. So she has these techniques and the first technique each uh, each round gains surge. And then I think it goes to the first technique each player. And then it goes to the... Oh, I, for some reason I thought it goes to every technique gains surge. But the techniques act like the, um, the ones from the heroes. So... Natasha Nebula gives her a passive ability, Retaliate 1, and then the special ability is Take 1 Damage. The special triggers off of her activation. So when Nebula act initiates an activa activation against you, resolve the special ability on each technique, then discard each one of those attachments. Then it goes to one of those attachments, and then you then move the top card of your deck from the game to choose and discard one of those attachments. So really cool design, really cool design. She's got this Nebula ship, which also, I think... We'll talk about Nebula Ship here in a second. But the techniques all have different ways that they are messing with Nebula, giving her retaliate, giving her like kind of a defensive ability. I do like the way that they synergize with the hero versions of the card too. I think that's just really cool design. Um, and then the lethal intent. It's, it's, I, I love the design. I love how, how they mess with that. Um, but that surge train can be so brutal, especially an expert when you start to... Um, not be able to get rid of all of those techniques every single turn. Um, so I, what I like to do is she's got, she's got a lot of health too, 17 and 20. And then in stage one, she's got 14 health. So what I have found is I typically, if I'm playing standard, I hit her for, or I set her up for a one flip kill. So I want to be able to deal that 17 damage on one I, once I flip her, so I don't have to deal with her side two that much. Probably the same thing as side three. She swings hard. She's really tough. The Nebula ship, I think, is interesting. I think that they had too much going on in one scenario. Um, whereas I kind of wish we would have seen a little bit more of like the Nebula ship mechanic in maybe Infiltrate. Or, I'm sorry, not Infiltrate. Uh, Escape, the museum, where Nebula ship... Uh, when the villain phase begins, place one evasion counter here, and then we can exhaust Milano, spend up to two resources, remove one evasion counter for each resource, and then we are increasing on the main for X is equal to the number of evasion counters on the ship. So I think that's really cool. I think it's just too much when you're already trying to deal with the surge train and what Nebula is throwing at you. I, I just think, I wish that we had this in another villain so but i really like what they did i like the hero way more than the villain let's go over here to the ranking we're gonna drop her in at these our villains in the game i'm gonna drop her above um no i'm gonna drop her in between so we're gonna go uh risky business nebula then collector too just she can be very swingy she can be very yeah she she can be very feel bad if you get unlucky pulls and and that that's an issue i think maybe the first time i played her i really liked her because as villain theory was saying i i got kind of lucky with some of those pulls and i really liked it i also probably was missing a ton of rules right it was the first time i the first time i played any scenario i missed a ton of rules i do that on stream still um but i really enjoyed nebula my first play Subsequent plays, moving into expert, I just got drawn into some bad stuff, and it just didn't work. Josh, the ship taxes your resources holes uh, simultaneously. The surge is taxing your actions. Yes, yes, yeah. Wow, the uh, simultaneous, yeah. So you're getting attacked from both sides, and I think one side would have been if you're either dealing with the surge or dealing with those counters. That would be a fun scenario. You combine it, it can become a very difficult and unfun scenario. Speaking of difficult and unfun, let's talk about Ronin. Um, so 
I have been talking about how capstone villains are awesome and we like the capstone villains and Ronan is not that. I don't like Ronan. I know that there are people that do enjoy the challenge that Ronan brings, but Ronan is not fun. I do not enjoy Ronan. He is too good. He is too strong. He's got 14, 18, 25 hit points. I don't think I've ever played Ronan Expert. Maybe? I don't know. I don't actually know if I played Ronin Expert. I don't know if I want to play Ronin Expert. I'll let I'll leave that to the the Death Scry players of the world. But Ronin. One thing I will say is Ronin got a lot better when they eroded the we're probably not gonna see it. It's probably gonna be down here. Sorry for the fast scrolling. I know that can kind of mess with some people sometimes. I let me say I love the I love the market. I love the market that Galaxy's provided. The, the market system and mechanic, I want to see more of that because I really liked that. I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah. When they said the Kree supremacy is optional. So that, that was an errata. They came out. Because look at this. This is dumb. This is dumb. Kree supremacy starts with 11 threat, an acceleration token, an amplify, and a hazard. Okay. Cool. Like that's that's great, I guess. Um, but Ronin comes with tough. If you have the power stone, which gets dictated who gets the power stone, uh, from the nebula encounters that. And then with, uh, and then basically the power stone states that if you ever deal three or more damage, you get the power stone or you get dealt three or more damage. Then, uh, Ronin takes back the power stone. So he gets additional boost cards. Um, <sighs> The Creek, oh yeah, it has a printed hazard icon on the Creek command ship. So you're playing heroic mode. And then um, when the treachery card is revealed, you can exhaust them a lot or spend a resource to cancel that's one revealed effect, which does give you a little bit of better uh, like consistency. I am typically always leaving the Milano unexhausted so I can cancel something. I hate this card. Fanaticism, I think, is the worst card in the game. Um, I am very much not... Um, not a fan of, uh, not a fan of fanaticism. Uh, the fact that it surges is just not fun. The fact that it surges is just not fun. Um, gives them a plus one that attack gains overkill and piercing. So you can't block it. It's, I don't know. I, uh, not a fan of Ronan. Um, there's two of them. I forgot that there are two of them. And then also you stand accused. Ronan attacks you with plus one attack. And he does not, he, he hits for two. If you're controlling the power stone, which you probably are, if you're, if you're winning two plus two boost cards. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't like Ronan. Let's, uh, let's go back to the tier maker. Uh, we're going to throw Ronan in the actually, I'd actually like to kill them behind absorbing man. I played Ronin in an expert a few times. As satisfying as it is to beat him, it feels more like the relief of pain, leaving you as any kind of actual happiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's that's really funny. That's really funny. Um <laughs> Yeah, it it just I mean, it, it feels like one of those you can say you did it. I ran a marathon. I I I did an Ironman. I beat Ronin, right? <laughs> That's probably not a fair comparison at all. But yeah, it just it just feels like something that I I don't have any intention or excitement at all trying to trying to beat or or go through it. it it's it's just frustrating. He throws so much at you. It's just not fun. It's just not fun. Whew. All righty. That is wave two, wave three. That was wave three. Wave four starts us out with Mad Titan Shadow and Ebony Maw. This is the first box that came out after I started the channel. So that is fun. This is actually I got Mad Titan Shadow because there is a delay in the release of Mad Titan Shadow in the US compared to Europe. I actually bought Mad Titan Shadow from Europe, had it sent to me. It got lost in the mail. Bought it again, got it sent to me, and still got it before the U.S. got it. Crazy. So I I got to stream, or I got to play uh, Mad Titan Shadow 
as the for my first time on stream or it was the first new box that came out on stream so that was fun ronin is on top i'm actually shocked i tell you shocked actually i'm not that shocked <laughs> fair <laughs> okay so ebony maw is the first villain in the mad titan shadow box i like ebony maw um i think he's a lot of fun he's a He's got a lot of health. So in sorry, in expert he's in 1823 and he's all about these uh spell cards. So the spell cards come out, the they enter it with invocation and the invocation counters get removed whenever Ebony Maw activates. And so like Fireball says that when four or when the four counters get removed, you deal four damage uh to your identity. And so this gives you some time to set up and build into getting ready for the fireballs or the manipulations or the rubble storms of the world um, before it actually comes up. So I, I like that. I think it's fun to plan around that. I will say that it can be a little frustrating with some of the cards because there's a couple. Yeah. Remove one invocation counter from each spell environment. And then like a advance or a gang up or a assault really hurts you in ebony maw because it, it it's counting down those timers big mad titan shadow fan and ebony maw is one of my favorites from it only problem is the lack of spells in a three or four player definitely feels best at one or two i've never actually thought about that that's interesting yeah that's a really interesting point because i guess you would run out of spells pretty quickly but yeah, the, the spells the spells are really interesting. I think the spells are cool. Ebony Maw has been one that I have tested decks out against. I I don't. It's not my go to because it does mess with it with those spells, um, giving you a little bit of time to prepare for what he's about to throw at you. I did play him with Star Lord, which was not not a good idea because it's got all of his spells have surge, and then Star Lord you're get, dealing yourself a ton of encounter cards, and so you're resolving so many encounter cards every single turn. That that was bad. That was very bad. Um. I hate Rubble Storm. Rubble Storm makes me sad. Deal two damage to each character you control, so that includes your allies. So it can be an ally wipe. And then the spells do trigger before the activation does. So it's when he activates. So you would remove that last counter on Rubble Storm. Clear, deal two damage to all your characters, probably killing most, if not all, of your allies. And then he would attack. So you lose your trump blockers, which can be a feel bad. But I mean, you do get three turns to prepare for it. So. Use your chump blockers earlier. Um, Ebony Maw is fun. I think Ebony Maw is fun. I think he provides a interesting and fun challenge. Um, at four player expert, you have every spell out on the board on turn one. Interesting. Yeah. So because you get a spell on your first scheme and then first uh, when he flips to stage two. So there's eight spells. So interesting. I, I never thought about that. What I like is the tactical element of the spells. You know something bad is coming, but you know what it is and can play around it. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Great way to put it. Great way to put it. He, he just allows you to tactically play the game. And I think that's really cool. We're going to flip over to our tier maker. Ebony Maw is going to be in the excited to get these on the table. Um... Hmm, where is he going to go? I think I'm going to put him in front of Mutagen. We're going to throw him in front of Mutagen. I, I, I really like Ebony Maw. I think he's a really interesting villain. I think that he requires a lot of fun decisions. And other than like the surprise removal of invocation counters, it can, or he, he's very, very fun to kind of tactically try and figure out how you're going to take four damage to the face or wipe all your allies or, you know, be stunned, confused, it's it's a really cool scenario. Alrighty, we'll go up next to Tower Defense, which is a dual villain scenario. So after they, they gave us some time after Wrecking Crew to bring back multiple villains, and Tower Defense does that. So you are fighting off against Proxima Midnight and Corvus Glaive at the same time. And they have different side, or they have different side schemes, and you are also protecting the Avengers Tower. What I dislike about the Avengers Tower mechanic is it feels not in campaign mode. If you're playing it standalone, um, Avengers Tower.
Oh, the unique rules is not play. Sorry, I just got confused. Uh, discard each other Avenger Tower from play. I was like, but it's unique. You can't have another Avenger. Yeah, okay. It's because the unique rule does not apply. That's fine. Right? I mean, we'll just not run Avengers Tower against it. But uh, after damage is placed here, if there's at least nine damage here per player, the players lose the game. So it's an additional loss condition. But if you're playing outside of campaign mode, uh, I have no qualms flipping this whatsoever. Just throwing the 18 damage on here is not, not a huge issue. This is one of the few missions that's much better in campaign mode. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it feels like an absorbing man in that sense, right? It has ramifications throughout the entire campaign that are more interesting than the scenario itself. Um, the I haven't played Mad Titan Shadow in a long time. I may get Mad Titan Shadow back out to the table because I enjoy the campaign. There are a couple of scenarios. Are there a couple of villains I don't really like? I think I like Tower Defense. It's just one of those that I haven't played that much, but I would like to play tower defense more. I think that the the dichotomy of the two villains, uh, each trying to you know manipulate and do different things. You're rotating the active villain, which is really cool, and it requires you to plan multiple turns in ahead. I yeah, I like it. Um, I, yeah, I like it. Um, it, it's much better than uh. It's much better than the the Wrecking Crew mod sets. But, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the Tier Maker. Villain Theory. I love how Tower Defense... I love Tower Defense, but the difficulty changes a lot based on player count. In Solo, Reign of Fire does 33 on one side and four player. Your tower is basically invincible. Yeah. Yeah. So, Reign Fire, deal three damage to Avengers Tower. So, yeah, that, that card becomes a lot less scary when you increase your player count. That's interesting that it's not like per player three plus or three per player damage like thematically i understand why that's not right but mechanically it does make sense that it would or it doesn't make sense that it does that that yeah that's interesting um i think mad titan shadow is the best campaign i think other boxes have better villains but mad titans is the best campaign interesting i think that's ooh, i think that's probably sinister motives for me i'm always always going to like Corvus scheme two out of Two thirds of the time, yeah. So the different main schemes, we've got Corvus Glaive's scheme and Proxima Midnight's Corvus. When this would be complete, remove all but one threat from this stage, and then deal each player one face down encounter card. And then Proxima, when this stage would be complete, deal six damage, six damage per player to the tower. Yeah. So the one encounter card is way, way easier to stomach than that under siege. The encounters aren't that bad. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to throw... We're going to throw this into... These are villains in the game. And it actually... There are two villains in this encounter set. So these are villains in the game. Um, we're going to throw... We're going to throw them... Above Risky Business. It's a scenario that I wish I played more of. I think that... I would like to play more of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I like I like the scenario. It's one. It's not my favorite, but I, I'm happy with that it did. It provides enough uniqueness to, uh, to to have some fun with. I wonder how they would work for a deck testing. I feel like it wouldn't be horrendous. I feel like it wouldn't be too bad. Um, that, may, that may be something that I try at some point. It's using uh, Tower Defense as a deck tester. Alrighty, up next we have Thanos. I when they announced this box, I really thought Thanos was gonna be sorry. Really thought Thanos was gonna be that top tier, that final capstone villain. He's the third villain in the box. Uh Thanos is beefy. He's got a Ugh. Diet Dr. Pepper. Uh he's got a lot of health, right? So in uh in standard, he's a 1623. In expert, he's a 2328. He's got he introduces the Infinity Gauntlet. So the Infinity Gauntlet um, has different activations based on what stone is in play. And you either place the stone in play or you you activate what stone is in play whenever uh, Thanos activates. It also gives him a plus one attack. So this is a 1, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5. Thanos is not 
not easy. He feels like a capstone villain with how difficult he is. The I guess like one of the nice things is his high threat threshold. He's got two schemes that both scheme out at 12. But once you do go from 12, you do snap yourself and you uh, you shuffle your discard pile and then you remove the top half of your deck from the game. So that can be very hit or miss on if that is going to be significant. There are some situations where that could actually make your deck way better. Um, I think that's less likely than not, but yeah. Thanos. I used to dislike this guy because of Stalwart. Stalwart is okay, but I dislike it being permanent. Not a big fan of spanning Stun and Confuse, but it feels bad when your hero comes with a lot of it, but I've grown to appreciate him. Yeah. The fact that he has Stalwart on every single card is a little frustrating. I like what they've done with Mutant Genesis, and they've started putting Stalwart on uh, like Stage 2 or Stage 3 and having Steady on the first one. And so I think that's a better mechanic and a little bit easier and more fun. Um, and it is, it is hard when he hits for five plus a boost guard and there's no sun. So you are throwing a lot of allies in front of him, which is feel bad. Um, the sanctuary is kind of interesting, right? So Thanos can't not take damage. This starts on the table when defeated. Each player may spend three physical resources, deal two damage for each physical and it ignores the tough, um, yeah, I think Thanos is one of those that is very challenging, but also not impossible. Um, yeah, Thanos can be rough. Thanos can be very, very tough. Uh, going back over to the tier maker, I'm going to throw... I'm, gonna, I'm probably actually going to throw Thanos and only play if randomly selected. I don't think I'm ever pulling Thanos out for fun. Um <laughs> Fun fact, if you replace a modular set with modulars that do not have minions, the space stone is just an instant acceleration token. Yeah, because space stone you discard until you get a minion. And he doesn't have any minions in his in his deck. And so yeah. Instant acceleration token. We're gonna throw Thanos above Zola. Only play randomly selected. I I just He feels like so long. He feels so much. Um he always seems he always felt on a similar level to Red Skull with you for difficulty. I feel like that's a really good comparison. I feel like that's a really, really good comparison right there. Um, it feels right about that level of difficulty. I just have less fun with Thanos than I do with Red Skull. Red Skull provides a unique challenge where Thanos is just, here's a lot of damage. You have to deal and take a lot of damage. It's a slugfest. Whereas Red Skull is a little bit more finesse. And I think I like that a little bit more. Um... Yeah, so Thanos is only play if randomly selected. Cool. Fourth hero in the box is Hella. Hella is so good. Hella is was my favorite scenario when I made my initial video. Um, she feels the most like a Lord of the Rings scenario where you're going on this journey. You're going, progressing through hell, trying to find Odin in order to rescue Odin and then allow Odin to come back and help you as an ally to bring you to victory. It's so satisfying. Wow. Thanos below collector too. Did Thanos run over your cat? Probably. Yeah. My cat got caught up in the snap. <laughs> my cat got caught up in the snap. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I've never brought out Thanos, Thanos to say, I want to play Thanos. Like that has never been a thought that has crossed my mind saying, Hey, let's, uh, let's play Thanos today. Whereas I have had that thought with collector too. Helen may have a love hate relationship. She suffers from a bit from risky business syndrome where you can game it by building up while she's weaker for the theme and experience is amazing. Yeah. I, I do think that there is a little bit of, of a gamified element to Hela. She has a super high threshold of 18. Um, but what you're doing is you have these side schemes and these big minions that progress whenever you, I think you have to kill the minion first. I can just look at it actually. Um, yeah, threat cannot be re re removed from Nidofalir. And so each one of these, it goes Garm, Scourge, uh, Nidhogg. And then they come out with the associated side schemes. And so you need to thwart these down. And then once you get uh, the final here, um, it, it's, I always have to, I always have to, um, 
I always have to reread and rethink about how this works. But basically, you have to go through each one of these side schemes, and then you can get Odin. And then Hela is she cannot be defeated um, until you control Odin. So you have to go through each one of these control Odin, and then you have to defeat Hela. Whenever you defeat Hela, before you control Hela. Before you control Odin, she flips over to her wounded side and then she removes all of her um, attachments. And then whenever you defeat a side scheme, she flips back to big Hela. Hela does get a lot stronger with more side schemes in the victory display. So she gets plus one, plus one, and plus two. Or a plus one, plus one, plus three for each side scheme in the victory display. And so as you progress, she has that same thing with Collector as she's getting stronger without actually changing out her card. Um, but it, it's fun. It's it's a fun one. It's odd, though. While you can game Hela, you like risky business. I'm always less tempted to with Hela, I think, because I enjoy the mission so much more. Yeah, I yeah, I love this mission. I think it's so much fun. It it provides a different couple of challenges. D20 and I need to replay our Hela Valkyrie Thor matchup. I think Thor is really fun, especially in a two player game, because these big minions are swapping uh, heroes. And so they, they, they engage the first player. And so that does count for an engagement for Thor. So you, if you switch Garm over to Thor, he gets to draw his two cards. And so that's fun. She has all of these like crazy. Um, she has all of these crazy attachments that boost up her stats, but they also go away whenever you defeat her. Hela is a ton of fun. I, I, I have a lot of fun with Hela. She is similar to Kang in the fact that like, she's not one that I'm just going to pull out and play. It feels more like an experience rather than what Marvel champions usually feels like where it's like a, what am I trying to say? It's a. Marvel Champions to me feels like a sit down and play game and it's a fun skirmish type situation, whereas Hella feels like more of an epic experience. Hella's Legions of Hell modular is super fun too. When she raises my signature ally from the dead, I take it personally. Yeah. Yeah, we when Jason and I were running through a scenario with Hella, uh she kept stealing Cosmo. And we were uh we just we were we were Voltron and Cosmo. No, that was that was Thanos. That was Thanos. Yeah, regardless. Um Hello is going to go to my top. I Hello is my favorite. I think Hello is still probably my favorite. Hello is just so much fun. I enjoy so much that there I there's just so much I enjoy about Hello and yeah, she she's not she she has not been dethroned from the top of the list yet. Alrighty, that leaves us with the capstone villain of the Mad Titan Shadow Box, which is Loki. I don't like Loki. I don't think I like Loki that much. Um, or no, no, I do not like Loki. Loki is frustrating, and that's that's what is annoying. So Loki has these different sites or these different versions. He has five different versions, and you have to kill a number of versions based on the difficulty of what you are playing. So an expert, you have to kill three different versions of Loki. Every single one of them has 20 hit points per player and they all work a little bit differently. So this Loki does a two scheme, one attack, retaliate one. This is a one scheme, three attack stalwart. So they all have a little bit different like angle on them. So it feels similar to a Kang. Um, I like a lot about Loki, but he has so much going on and takes forever on expert mode. Yeah. It's 60, 60 health per player is so much, and he's just so frustrating. He can just be so very frustrating. He's swapping in and out. Um, after you make a... Yeah. I'm trying to figure out... Oh, yeah, he also has the Infinity Stone. Yeah, he has the Infinity Gauntlet, which is, which is another really tough part about Loki. Um, th this card. I hate this card. <laughs> when a real swap Loki with a random set aside Loki, Loki activates against you. And so he can be so very swingy depending on what you're what you're sitting in. So if you think that you're safe rolling down to a one and then you flip into the three scheme Loki, you're you're in a lot of trouble. He does have a pretty high threat threshold, so it's 12. So that is okay. But I don't know. Loki Loki is to me um more frustrating than he is fun. 
However, he's not anywhere near the like the bottom of the bottom. We played him recently in that Star Lord deck I posted in the Discord. We won, but suffered immensely. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like there are there's there's a level of difficulty that I enjoy where it feels like it's not just frustrating. Which like to be fair, on theme, so very much with Loki, right? He wants to be the trickster. He wants to be the frustrating hero that you are the villain that you have to face off against. I'm just he he throws so many things at you that just makes you not. I don't know. I I don't I don't enjoy Loki. Let's let's flip back over to our tier maker. We're gonna drop him only. We're gonna go. I'd actually ah. I'm trying to ooh okay. I don't know if I'd actually like to kill. I'm gonna put him only play if randomly. No, I'm gonna put him in the top of. I'd actually like to. Kill. I don't like him. If, if he came up as a as a random villain, I would probably go ahead and re-roll that random random villain check. So, alrighty, that is Mad Titan Shadow. We got a couple of more villains to go through. I'm gonna do a quick break. We're gonna I'm gonna go grab a refill and all of that good stuff. But when we come back, we're gonna talk about the hood and then talk about sinister motives so i will see you all very very soon Alrighty, welcome back we are going to be continuing on in our uh, four cycle four cycle four uh this break music goes hard love it i feel like i'm at an epic battle this is basically what i heard in my head when you got to galaxies well thank you so very much yeah i had it composed uh or i had someone on fiverr or one of those one of those freelance sites they're the ones who made the Arkham Horror, Lord, Lord of the Rings, and the Marvel stuff, and I think that they did a phenomenal job. I really, I really like what they did. Streamer on break, time to misbehave. Ah, <laughs> well, thank you for not burning down the stream. I appreciate it. But it's time. It's time to talk about the hood. So the hood is up next. The hood is really, really cool. I really like what the hood did for the game. It added that standard two, expert two modular set, which I like the idea more than I liked the impl our implementation. I do wish that the um, I I think it was actually you, Villain Theory, that was talking about it uh, earlier this week, talking about how it would be really cool to get like a standard three expert three that kind of falls in the middle of those two difficulty. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, but the hood is uh, the one that requires the most modular sets, so I think you pick six, right? Seven. You pick seven modular sets. And set them aside you shuffle them in and then as you go through the game you get to add more mod sets into the deck and so this is this is really interesting i i love the way that this plays oh i like that idea of a standard three yeah i i don't see how they why they would not do that i think it'd be cool to have another version of standard that that you know is that 1.5 lion king one and a half type type strategy but the hood um the hood is he has this foul play ability and is discard the top card of the encounter deck if that card does not belong to the hood's encounter set deal it to yourself as a face on encounter card so as you add more and more non-hood encounter cards into the deck this foul play is going to hit harder especially because it starts to get more frequent so like in stage three you discard two and it becomes and each card discarded this way gets dealt to you as a face down encounter card what i love about the hood is the variability that the hood provides right you can choose the seven modular sets you can choose randomly you can choose the ones that they put in there i think we did a hood with the six from mojo so like the the different shows that was a fun that was a fun one but all of them are, it's just cool. It's just cool. I think I like the setup of what the hood provides more than I actually like the hood as the villain. Like I like the the interactions that you can create with the modular sets more so than I like the actual hood cards. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it was a really good, it was a really good set. It was a really good mod modular set. There, I think there is one card in here that adds sets. Yep, yep. So field recruitment. So you remove the card from the game, but when revealed, you choose one set aside modular set. What is very tough, what is very tough about the hood is that you start out with 16 cards plus one modular set. 
Actually, I guess it would, I guess it would be what? There are three side schemes, so ten cards. Uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, ten cards plus the modular set. And so as you're going through, when you're adding in these modular sets, your deck is going to get pretty small pretty quickly. And that means that you are going to be diving into one modular set when you add it. So if you add a modular set, then um, you have more likelihood of hitting that because half the deck that is not that modular set is in the discard pile and so if you have modular sets that play off of each other if you have like uh teamwork modular sets with the acolytes or something in there you are very easily going to be hitting multiple of those also the acolytes would be a horrendous thing to add to the hood that would be kind of fun i love the modulars that come with the hood outside of standard two and expert two i think they're all smash hits but the hood scenario itself he joins nebula and ronin in the surge club I can enjoy him, but I have to very carefully curate the modular sets. Too hard and it's too swingy, and too easy, it's too easy. Yep. Nope. Totally agree. Yeah. I think it was Josh that was saying that he, they. Josh thinks that this that the hood is one of the hardest solo expert villains, just because of how many cards you are resolving. Modulars are great. The hood is fine. Yeah, and I think that's what I was. I yeah. I. I like the interactions that you can create, but you do have to be very careful in what you put in there. I just like being able to set up two games simultaneously with standard two. I don't have the time for four player, but can have two games going at once. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's really nice. Um, so over on the tier maker, we're going to throw the hood into, these are villains in the game. I'm going to put the hood above Nebula. I like the hood, but if you choose randomly, like it says that you can, it can get very, very swingy. But I also like, I like a lot of what the hood can do depending on what you put into the game. So if you have mod sets that work together, I think that that's a really fun way to play the game. Standard 2 and Expert 2 were tough, but the mod sets that came in the hood were great. I agree with you there, Villain Theory. Okay. Time to talk about Sinister Motives. Up first, we have Sandman. I like Sinister Motives. I think Sinister Motives is my favorite campaign. By that, what I mean is it's my favorite way to play campaign style. I don't love playing the campaigns in Marvel Champions, but I really like... If I had to pick my favorite one, it would be Sinister Motives because you have this reputation track. It increases your power level alongside, a, alongside with the villain power level, which I think is a really cool way to do that. Like, S.H.I.E.L.D. is helping you, and then also you have higher reputation, meaning that the villains are going to be spending more time trying to thwart you or hinder you. Um, the villains in Sinister Motives, I think, are all pretty cool. I think I, I like the villains in Sinister Motives um, a lot. A lot. I like Sandman. Sandman is all about dealing the indirect damage. He's also got this city streets. So whenever Sandman attacks, he deals indirect damage. If he deals damage to you, then um, yeah. If if it deals damage to you, then you resolve searching sands. Searching sands is you place one sand counter here and then discard cards from the top of the encounter deck equal to the number of sand counters on that deck or number of sand counters there. Then uh, if you run out of your encounter deck, you place an acceleration token, meaning that this nine threat threshold is going to be pretty tough, but it has a forced response after you place an acceleration token on this game, deal three damage to the first player. And so there's a lot of different angles that are throwing damage at you in this scenario. And that that's cool. Salmon is such good design. They really make a, they really make a few cards and counters feel like he's, uh, filling the streets with sand and overwhelming you. Big fan. Yeah. Yeah. If mechanically, it's really cool, and thematically, it's really cool. Uh, the city streets, you can exhaust a character you control or remove sand counters from here, equal to that character's attack. So, that doesn't have to be your hero, but it can be like the Hulk. My favorite my favorite is the Hulk ally. You get to uh, just have Hulk sit out there and shovel sand counters all game, and not need to discard the top card and may maybe kill everyone on the table. And then I also really like these sand clones. So the sand clones are a 1x3 where X is equal to the number of counters on city streets. And so kind of are similar to what you were saying, Villain Theory, is that when, like, it makes you feel like he's flooding the streets with sand, right? If you can't, you can't sit there with 
like 10 sand counters and hope to win, especially when a sand clone comes out and hits you for 10. Now he only has three health, so you could kill him pretty easily, but it just like distracts you a little bit. He also has a pretty good health size, right? He's an 18, 19, um, an expert in 16, 18 and standard. But I, I'm a big fan of Sandman. I think Sandman's really fun. He does require the city in chaos, so Rhino makes another appearance as a as a uh, enemy in that first box. But Sand, Sandman's really cool. I, I I really like how he goes from indirect to indirect, and then he goes to overkill. And so, th yeah, just cool design. Just really cool design. On the tier maker, I'm gonna throw him on the excited to. Always excited to get him on the table list. Um, I'm going to put him above Ebony Maw. I, I, I like Sandman. I, I like Sandman more the more I play him as well. Because he has enough going on. Not too much. He doesn't have too much going on. But he has enough that you have to divert that attack into shoveling sand. Or else you're going to very quickly be overrun by sand. And that is a fun decision for me to make. So I, I like Sandman. This is a good box. This is a really good box. Up next, we have Venom. Venom is number two. I like Venom. I like Venom. I, yeah, there, there's a lot to like in this box. Uh, Venom is interesting. We were talking about him a little bit earlier in the stream. Talking about how he has this bell tower. I think it was when we were talking about Risky Business. So Venom has a similar mechanic to Risky Business where he has a bell tower where... If you deal damage to Venom, you can instead place chain counters on the bell counter or ugh, the bell chime counters on the bell tower card. And then if there's at least three per player, you can flip it over to the ringing and Venom starts to take extra damage. Uh, as a force to interrupt, when Venom's attack would deal any amount of damage to an identity, remove that many chime counters from here. For each chime counter removed, prevent one of that damage. Then if there's zero, it flips back over to the quiet side. So Venom is like distracted with the ringing bell, and you can um, you have a you have a protection here. Uh, Venom also gets a extra boost card every single time you damage him with a card you control. So I think that's here. When Venom activates against you, move each boost card from your identity to Venom. So whenever after you attack and damage Venom with a card you control, place one face down boost card on your identity. So. Um, and then it goes to two if it's the first one per turn. So you, you start getting these boost cards and it can be a little challenging to, um, to chump block because in the symbiotic strength, there is a card that gives him overkill. Oh, also, uh, now we're angry gives him overkill. So you can't, you cannot just sit there and chump block rack up. 10 boost cards because you're probably going to flip into an overkill and also this now we're angry this boost icon resolves immediately so you attach it he gets the plus one and overkill you can die very quickly if you play venom incorrect or play venom out out of out of sync Venom is such a good design too. Although we played him recently and I went Quicksilver, in addition to getting a million boost cards due to redding and attacking him so much, his retaliate and stage three shredded me. Had a lot of fun. I don't remember if he has piercing. I don't think he does. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. Um, my favorite thing to do with uh, Venom so, uh, if this is a constant ability, so you cannot ignore it. You have to flip this card when you get three per player. I love to put this at two and then swing web kick or other big, big attack and drop it, flip it to 10. So if there's at least 10, then it flips out and you're preventing 10 damage and e increase all damage. Venom takes by one. That is not per attack. That is any damage. So now your retaliates are retaliate two, your electrostatics are two, your flow like waters are two. I love playing Venom against protection because now he's starting to take a lot of damage and you're dealing damage not on attack, so you're not getting those boost cards. That's my favorite way to play him. You throw like your electrostatic armors, you throw everything, and as he's attacking you, 
Uh, and then you don't take any damage because of the bell tower. It's so much fun. That's my absolute favorite way to play with Venom is against protection. And yeah, just, just let it go. I do think in solo, it can be... I think, yeah, it's amplified in solo. But it can be a little gamified with this 3. Because you can bump it up to like 7 to 10 with one big attack. And then you can... You have a lot of time before you can take damage. Because this is... Uh, when you attack would deal any amount of damage. So if you are preventing damage, it does not remove the time counters. Um, now that is when it would deal any damage. So you do have to look at the stack there and make sure that your, your timing is correct there. But I, I like Venom. The one thing I love about Marvel Champions is when they have an idea and it doesn't quite land, they tend to learn and make a better version. Collector 1 to Project Right Away, Colt to Drax, Wrecking Crew to Sinister 6, uh, Vision to Shadowcat, Valkyrie to Rogue, etc. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, Venom Venom is fun. Venom is fun. This Retaliate 1 Steady and Toughness on Stage 3 when he has 20 health can be brutal. Uh, what's the odd rules interaction with Hero Venom in this mission? Um, I don't know. I actually don't know. I assume you can because I think that this is Eddie Brock and not um, Flash. So the, the hero is Flash. And I think this is supposed to be Eddie Brock Venom. Because the ally that you get in the in the scenario or in the campaign is eddie brock and so i assume that's this venom coming to join you so i think you can play it um maybe someone else knows i'm sure there's a ruling around there somewhere venom is going to be going to the always excited to get this on the table we're going to drop him in Oh, where do we want to drop Venom in? I'm going to drop him in. I'm going to drop him in above Sandman. I like him more than Sandman. I, I like that he rewards you when you play protection, which is my favorite aspect. And he's just fun. He's just a fun hero. And where you can gamify it a little bit, I feel like it's more fun to gamify because you're still taking a lot of risk with those boost cards that he, are being dealt out to him that it's it can be tough. It's something to do with one of the cards affecting Hero Venom, as it just says Vi Oh! Oh, that's what- uh, I don't know. Um, attached to Venom. So, if you- if you have Venom out there, I see what you're saying. Increase all damage Venom takes by one. Does that include Flash? That's interesting. I, I mean, like, rules as intended, no, right? Like, well, I, I assume rules as intended, no. But, like, attached to Venom, I don't think... No, attachments can't go on heroes. Huh. After Venom takes any amount of damage from an attack, remove an equal number of threat from here. So, like, if you have Flash out, um, that's it. It's the Bell Tower. Yeah. And then, like, if you have Flash Out, after Venom takes any amount of damage from an attack, remove an equal amount of threat from here. So if Venom attacks Flash and he takes three damage, do you remove three threat from here? Because it's Venom? I, I actually don't know. I assume that that has been clarified somewhere in the rulings. That it's... You, you should put, like, vin, Villain Venom up here or something. Because, that, yeah, that seems... That seems that seems like an, that seems an, like an interesting oversight. I... I'm surprised that they did that. Huh. Maybe it is supposed to have meant to, it's meant to do that. Do you know if if Flash has the same issues with sound and everything that I think it I think it does because it's the same symbiote, right? So I yeah, maybe it may be supposed to thematically work like that where the Flash is taking the additional damage and everything because he's kind of distracted by the same noises that, that Eddie is. It's interesting. If anything, it's really interesting. <laughs> Okay. Up next, we have, I think, yeah, we have the weakest villain in the box, in my opinion. Up next is Mysterio. Mysterio is, uh, I, I, I think, a, a, an interesting design. Mysterio is the um, highlight or the, the person that we are featuring in this month's monthly challenge. So Mysterio is... 
all about adding encounter cards into your deck. So after you receive a boost card during an activation, if it has the illusion trait, put it in your discard pile, then on the bottom of your deck, and then on the top of your deck. And so these illusion cards then have, you know, they're shifting apparitions. They are deja vus. I actually know it's not deja vu. Um, there are a couple other illusion cards in some of the mod sets that are required. Um, and personal nightmare and whispers of paranoia, I think has some, but it, it's an interesting design. I like the shifting apparition design where it has the one health. If it was defeated with excess damage, then you have to shuffle the top card of the encounter deck into your deck. I think that's fun. I think it's interesting. I just don't, I, I don't know. I, I'm just not a big fan of Mysterio. Um, that being said, he's much better than a lot of the, uh, than the villains that I'm not a fan of. You're a big fan of Mysterio too. Uh, Sinister Motives is great. Very dramatic fight. Dynamic fight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mysterio is, when I say I'm not a fan of Mysterio, it's not like he's not on the level of a collector one or like an absorbing man. Right. But I do like how he evolves. He is, I think, the only villain in the game where his health goes down as you progress. So he goes 15, 17, 16. And so he does get less health on stage three than he does on stage two. Um, and it, it it can be a slog, right? If you if you if you get a ton of those encounter cards in your deck and they get dealt out to you, you can have you're in for a rough turn. One thing that I will say is the uh, in Personal Nightmare, Fool's Paradise is one of my favorite card designs in the game. So Fool's Paradise is the uh, card that is a acceleration, a hazard, and a crisis yeah crisis and it has like eight threat and then it also says every hero gets plus two hand size or something like that and so it rewards you but it's fool's paradise because you should not leave it out there because you will lose the i love it i love it it's such a good such a good design um yeah so mysterio we're gonna we're gonna throw him in we're gonna throw him into these are villains in the game i'm gonna throw him behind the hood I think I prefer the hood a little bit more if you curate that matchup. And Mysterio is, I think, interesting the first couple times, but has kind of fallen off as someone I don't love anymore. Nelson, they did rule Venom versus Venom. The villain cards only affect the villain Venom, and the hero cards only affect the hero Venom. Got it. Okay. Which is interesting because I know that there's another weird matchup with Nebula and Gamora teaming up and... Gamora's nemesis coming out. Gamora can't, or Nebula can't in her play, but I think it's her side scheme saying that Nebula gets plus one attack. So that does affect Nebula as well, at least when we played it, it did. So there's a, there's, there's some weird interactions now that we're starting to get different heroes as different allies or minions or anything in the game. And so that that's kind of fun. Okay, up next, we have Sinister Six. Sinister Six was in my top five. It was my second favorite scenario um, when I did my villain ranking last time. I do think, yeah, the top five villains was before Mutant Genesis came out. And I think Sinister Six, or um, Sinister Motives was fairly new. I... Sinister Six has fallen off of my favorable scenarios pretty quickly the more I play it. I think it's very easy. I think I think that's the biggest problem for me. I like the idea of it. I think that it's really cool. I think it's a much better implementation than like a Wrecking Crew than a multiple villain situation. But Sinister Six is pretty easy and can be pretty gamified. Um, with like the difference... Uh, Villains, whenever they come out, they come in this activation order, and then after they attack and damage you, you place one threat on each, or you trigger an ability, and then you move the active counter to the next villain in the order. So it goes one, two. If Hobgoblin is not out, Electro would jump to Craven. So there, it, it's a really interesting design, but what I have found in solo play is that it's pretty easy to kill these off. And the reason you want to kill these off is similar to Escape the Museum. There is, you win by thwarting down the side scheme. Where's the side scheme? Here we go. 
So light at the end. It's permanent hinder 10, so players cannot win unless they escape. Um, so it comes in with 20 threat in a solo game. Whenever you thwart it down, uh, you resolve the ambush ability, meaning that you put in a new villain, and then you flip this over. This comes in with 15 and a uh, a hat or yeah hazard. The problem is, uh, yeah, and then whenever you defeat the villain, you remove four threat, or if it's the final villain, it's the last villain out there, you remove seven threat. The problem is, is I feel like this this scenario is very susceptible to not taking damage, putting that active counter on a specific villain, or once you kill all of them off, if you only ever have one villain out on the table, it gets really easy to mitigate that. The Where the challenge does come in is some of these cards that are like gang up or team up cards, basically. So let me see if I can find one. Uh, frequent flyers. Uh, so put the put set aside hobgoblin and vulture into play. If hobgoblin is already in play, take two damage. If vulture is already in play, discard one card at random from your hand. So there are ways to get more villains out there. Um, but I I've found especially in solo with the thirty five threat that you have to remove, and you get to remove a lot when you do kill the villains. That the villain health threshold is pretty low, right? It's 10, 7, 9, 9, 8, 8. So it's not super hard to kill the villains. It, it's it got, it, it just seems easy. The It seems easier. I do like what they have started adding where there's additional benefits for um, expert mode. Yeah. I was a huge fan of Sinister Six originally, and I still think it's fun, but it's dropped on my list. Shame it's not more customizable. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I I didn't realize that it didn't that you couldn't customize it. Yeah, that that actually is a big hit for me too. Um, that it doesn't have a mod set that you can use, but I do really like how it says you know in expert mode this card cannot be canceled. There are things that. You know, increase the difficulty other than just printing higher stats on the villain to make the expert cards more interesting. But at the end of the day, I think I think Sinister Six has kind of fallen off and has fallen into the same trap that Wrecking Crew has, um, where it's it was really cool the first couple of times, but the more I play it, the less I enjoy it. So with that being said, I'm probably going to throw this in the only play I've randomly selected category, which is a huge drop, right? It was number two. It was my second favorite scenario of the entire game. But to be fair, when I made the list, I had not played it that much. Now that I've played it probably 15 times, I don't know, 15 to 20 times, it's it's gotten very samey. It's gotten very just like gamifiable and it's mediocre. I'm going to put them above Thanos. I still like them. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna put them as a these are villains in the game. I I I would still pull them out. I still think that it's an interesting scenario, but and I would choose to play them and not necessarily just choose to play them if they were randomly selected. So I I, I am gonna bump them up to these are villains in the game. But it, it's it was a really cool idea. It was really cool for the first couple of plays. Which I mean to be fair, it may maybe all you really need for some of these scenarios, right? I, I'm happy that I got to play uh, Sinister Six. I'm happy that it's a scenario in the game. I probably will not play it super frequently anymore, but I'm happy that I got to experience it. Is If I get 15 plays out of any other game, then I'm happy with that, right? So maybe I'm being a little bit too critical, but that's what, that's what these are made for, right? <laughs> Alrighty, so last, the capstone villain for the Sinister Motives campaign box is Venom Goblin. Ah, Venom Goblin, I have a love-hate relationship with. He is the symbiotic version of Mutagen Formula, basically. So, he is tough. Venom Goblin is tough. He's got three different sides, or three different main schemes. He's got lower, middle, um, or midtown, and upper Manhattan. And the active counter, or the glider counter, is jumping around on these three different schemes and based on what whatever has the least amount of threat on it the other really cool thing about this is that you lose if there are ever um if you lose two of these main schemes if you lose the main scheme they flip over you resolve the win revealed ability and then if there's at least two symbiote environments in play the players lose the game 
Venom Goblin's tough. Venom Goblin is very, very tough. He starts, he's a 16 health in stage 1, 18, and then 21. He becomes a 3 3, retaliate 1 stalwart toughness. Venom Goblin expert is insane. I remember we, at Con of Heroes, we played an expert game of Venom Goblin, and we lost. We lost the, or I died before I finished resolving my initial encounter cards. Um, because stage two, when revealed, deal two face down encounter cards. So you are starting with, um, three encounter cards per player, like two plus the one that gets dealt at the end of the villain phase. Um, then is it required? I can't, I can never remember if it's required. Uh, yeah, so Goblin Gear is a mod set, but Goblin Gear is horrendous. The the um, the advanced glider that says that Venom Goblin, after he activates, activates again against you is or attacks you. I don't even remember that 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 card is horrendous. That card is so bad. Um, I hate that card. But without that, and since it is a mod set, looking at Venom Goblin as a design, I enjoy Venom Goblin. I think Venom Goblin is a very challenging scenario, but I think that he doesn't ruin your day like Ronin. Now, that being said, I don't love him in Expert. I typically am going to be running him in a standard game because in Expert, he, he can be a little unbearable. Now, it can be done. It has been done, but... It, I don't I don't know if it's fun right I don't, I don't know if it's if, if it's fun I do like the management of the three different main schemes losing one makes it a lot more scary to lose another one and if, uh whenever you resolve the special it's a different special um yeah venom goblin I love how somatic and epic he feels but he has so much going on he can be very frustrating yes also this we are one is insane plus three plus three spend three printed resources so wild does not count to discard this card that can be a game changer um symbiotic monstrosity is horrendous retaliate one steady toughness while the symbiote environment is in play it gets plus three hit points and so it can get uh like when you lose a main scheme you have a symbiotic or a symbiote environment oh wait actually i don't think i ever oh no yeah never mind Oh yeah, okay. So while there are no other symbiote environments in play, this card is considered a symbi symbiote environment. So they're yeah, it's crazy. I know a popular fix is replace Goblin Gear with Goblin Gimmicks from Mutagen Formula. Yeah, yeah, and I, I recommend doing that or just swapping that out. I think Goblin Gear is over cranked in terms of difficulty, especially with Venom Goblin. That that advanced glider and then a tutor for advanced glider is not good. Not good. But I, I, I like I like what's going on. I typically am only looking to play him in that standard mode. Um, Expert is tough. Expert is very, very tough because you, you're dealing three encounter cards um, when you flip to stage three. And then if you want to try and... It, it would be really tough to one turn kill a Venom Goblin on in solo. It's 21 damage plus a toughness. So Venom Goblin, oh, Venom Goblin's tough, but I think he's a fun tough. I'm going to throw him into the always excited to get him on the table, uh, but at the very back. He's flirting with these are villains in the game, but I I like the challenge that he provides. He can be very, very tough. He can be very frustrating, but I think if you lower it to standard, he feels like an expert villain, right? If you're playing standard Venom Goblin, he feels expert, and that's how I like to play him, so... He's tough. He's tough. But I, I I do think that they did a much better job with Venom Goblin as the um, capstone villain of the Sinister Motives than they did with the previous two cycles. So. Alrighty. Man, we're just cranking through these. We got Mutant Genesis up next. Mutant Genesis is the release of X-Men into the game. How hype was it when they announced this? I mean, the 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 uh, the cards are great. I I I I love this. I love this box. I think that this box was was really really solid. And how hype was it when they announced it? It was so cool. We were getting X Men. It was so exciting. I'm I'm excited. 
Okay, so the first villain in the X Men box was Sab is Sabretooth. Um, Sabretooth is the one that I got to play at um, at Gen Con. Sabretooth with his uh, 13, 15, 18 hit points. Do, don't let that fool you because he heals after every activation. So after Sabretooth activates against you, discard the top card of the encounter deck. Heal damage from Sabretooth equal to the number of printed uh, boost icons that way. This makes it so that Sabretooth hangs around very, very long and rewards you for doing a lot of damage. So none of this like quick burst damage, like you don't want to hit him for one because he will heal that right back. There's You want to be hitting him for eight to 10 to a turn if you can, and that's how you kill him. And so the strategy that I've seen is you build up, build up, build up, and then swing. That is counteracted. And I like the way that they did this with the Robert Kelly. Now, Robert Kelly, I, I have, you know, mixed feelings about actually wanting to save Robert Kelly. But the first player controls Robert Kelly. He does not account against your ally limit. And then when an enemy resolves an undefended attack against you, deal that damage to Robert Kelly. If Robert Kelly ever dies, he has nine hit points because apparently he is some super freak super soldier. Um, he, you lose the game. Robert Kelly starts under... Uh, the main scheme. I don't quite remember which one it is, but after resolving step one of the villain phase, deal two damage to Robert Kelly, um, or three damage if there's at least six threat here. Um, once we thwart down, find the senator, which is five per player, we get to take Robert Kelly, and then we advance to um, 2A. And so it prevents you from building too much because Robert Kelly is taking this damage. <laughs> BB. I mean, if you let Robert Kelly die, then the rest of the campaign doesn't happen, and maybe that's a good thing. That's fair. We are talking about butterfly effect at this point. So, how how does if Robert Kelly doesn't happen, do Sentinels ever invade? I don't know. That's a that's a moral question that we all need to ask ourselves. But I I like. I see a lot of hate for Sabretooth. I think it was odd to have such a unique villain as the first... Yes, once, same. And Colossus has a bad matchup with him. Yes. Um, but I like... That said, I like him. I know he rewards protection. Rescuing and protecting a VIP is very unique. Yeah, I like... Yeah, I, I really like how you said that, Villain Theory. I like the design of Sabretooth. I think that it is a little bit frustrating. And I like the pacing of Sabretooth. I think that it's fun because you want to rescue Robert Kelly, but you want to rescue Robert Kelly when you know that you can protect him. And you cannot wait too long, so you have to kind of rush that beginning, and then you have to figure out how to protect Robert Kelly, and then you have to figure out how to kill Sabretooth. So it feels like a scenario of three different parts, which is unique and it's different. Um, the healing, I think, is the most frustrating part. I think that is the most frustrating part because... If you take undefended attacks, it goes against Robert Kelly, but undefended does not include chump blocking, so you can so you can chump. And so I, I found that, that to be a fairly effective strategy. So building up, building up, building up, doing a lot of damage, not letting him heal too much. I think he's probably more frustrating in higher player counts as well, because he's healing after every single activation. So that's annoying. Um the fact that like He's, he has a consistent healing after every activation. So if you deal eight damage to him and he heals two, right? He held, he healed 25% of the damage that you dealt. Now, if you did 20 damage, um, in a four player game, I mean, that, that's still pretty good, right? Right at the beginning. That's like one, you have other people managing other things, but then he heals four times. And so now, what would that be? That'd be 40% of his health. And so that, I think, can be a little frustrating. But I, he has Stalwart in here somewhere, right? I think he does. Yeah. So if you can avoid Animal Ferocity and avoid him getting Stalwart, you can Stun Lock or Confuse Lock him, which does prevent that healing, which which is nice. I, I like Saber... I, you know what? I have not played Sabretooth enough. I feel like... I feel like I like the other scenarios in this box way more than I like Sabretooth, but I, I enjoy Sabretooth. This is why there are no second 
box announced in the FFG timeline. Kelly died, so no need for a second box. <laughs> I like it. I really like Sabretooth personally. Maybe my favorite mission in the box. Maybe, maybe Sentinels. Nice. Yeah, no, I, I think, I, th I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Also, I think I'm. I don't remember where. I'm on this page somewhere. I'm pretty sure. Where is it? Maybe not. Okay, never mind. Okay. Yep. Okay. So let's go over to the tier maker. <clears throat> Saber tooth. I'm gonna put him in. These are villains in the game at the very top of the list because I have not previously been super excited. Um. I have not been previously super excited to get Saber tooth onto the table, but I do really like. I think I like him more than I give him credit for. So I need to play him more. Hey, Brands, how's it going? Super late. Who is number two to Ultron? So currently we have Hella, Red Skull, Ultron, Kang as our top four. And Taskmaster is up there in our fifth spot. And Taskmaster would bump up because that top slot is um, our top five. But there's at least one hero or one villain that's going to make it into that love killing them category. But Ultron, Ultron is is in that top five. He was not when I made my video a couple of months ago. But the more the more I play and the more I interact with the game, the more I enjoy Ultron. So I assume Ultron is your favorite. Alrighty. Next up, Project Wide Awake: The Sentinels. I love Project Wide Awake. I think Project Wide Awake is awesome. It is a great way to show that they learned from taskmaster it's a great way that they should learn from um oh my gosh what is uh, uh infiltrate the museum yeah i'm glad you have come around <laughs> ultron is your favorite nice yeah it's a good one to have your as your favorite he's a really fun hero or a really fun villain but project wide awake is the growth of scenario design in spades in my opinion i think that this is the best display of growth in design for me because two things so they have the um let's talk about operation wide awake which is a required scenario or a required mod set in this scenario and it says when an ally is defeated by an enemy attack it goes under the operation wide awake um operation zero tolerance operation zero tolerance sorry and if there are four cards i think per player I, I don't quite remember then it's you lose the game so it prevents chump blocking but it also does not mean that your minions that you defeat are going in the collection or if any upgrades you lose are going into the collection and so it provides an alternate loss condition that has you shift your focus on how you're playing the game without making it super frustrating and unbearable so you have to figure out how to defend for your allies or sacrifice your allies right because um if you, if you chomp block with an ally, you do not get them back in that scenario. And it increases that timer for the additional loss condition. There are cards in the game that will require you to place cards under Operation Zero Tolerance. And it's not necessarily just an immediate effect. It is at the end of your turn, you um, place this card under the... Our operation zero tolerance and then as an alter ego action you can get rid of it and so there's just ways to mess with it and i just think that they did such a good job of figuring out how to make you approach the game differently without making it super frustrating project wide awake is great i find it very hard with low defense heroes don't bring hawkeye but it's good another scenario that rewards protection too that may be why i love it just i i love protection right um and then also the um what are they called? Abduction protocols. So you got these abduction protocols, which is not just the straight five. It does have the hinder. And then the player defeated the scheme takes one random captive ally. And then the captive allies are here. They are not as good as the other captive allies, which um, I think is a good thing. They are unique. I think they're more unique. They're different, right? So Cannonball takes minus one consequential damage when he attacks and defeats a minion. And then uh, Boom Boom is my favorite, right? So Boom Boom places a bomb counter, and at the end of the player phase, remove all bomb counters, deal two damage. 
per bomb counter on that enemy. And so there's just a lot going on. They're, they're more interesting allies and the fact that you get to bring them out. So when revealed, when revealed, when revealed, you get a copy of Abduction Protocols. So you don't have to hope to draw into them. One way or another is still very good here because you can go get them, but it feels like they're helping you get to the Abduction Protocols a little bit better. I like how they're Crisis Icons. That makes a little bit more sense thematically than an Acceleration Icon. So I, I'm a big fan of Project Wide Awake. Fabulous scenario. Only improvement they can make is a little button that plays the 90s theme song when you play it. Nice. I love that. That'd be great. Uh, Tier Maker. We're going to come over. We're going to throw Sentinels. Uh, we're going to throw Sentinels behind Ultron. Uh, he, they're going to take our... They're, they're going to fill out our top five slot right now. Now, that may change, but Sentinels is just such a great design. I, I love I love playing Project Wide Awake. That's all true, but Taskmaster has Moon Knight, so we know who's... Oh, that's fair. I didn't think about that. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I... Yeah. It, it's a good scenario. It's a very, very, very good scenario. Alrighty, moving on to Master Mold. Master Mold is um, a, a, a Master Mold's interesting. So Master Mold has um, this is yeah. Hall of Heroes got weird with what they with what they're displaying because it looks like pictures from Gen Con or something. But so Master Mold is um. He is someone who has stalwart printed on him, so that can be a little frustrating. He, I think the most unique thing about Master Mold is that when he schemes, he doesn't get a boost card, but you discard until you get a minion, and then the minion schemes as well. Surely this is last after your fun with Gamora versus Master Mold. That I did not enjoy. Those are your photos. Nice. Nice. Brant's photos. Check that out. Is <laughs> it the counter? That's so fun. Uh, nice. Also, Master Mold with his quote low threshold, health threshold. He does have that tough. It was a 12, 14, 16. But each Sentinel minion gains guard. He does require Sentinels. Yeah, he does require Sentinels. You can throw zero tolerance in there. Um, and what I was doing when I was doing this as a um, scenario that would be a good deck tester. I was not utilizing the Magneto ally. The Magneto is not here, but he's a two, he's a two, three um, ally. And then if he defeats a Sentinel minion, then you get to heal a damage from him, I think. Um, Yep, and the first time I did it, it was Wolverine, and Wolverine did not have any issues whatsoever with Master Mold. Gamora struggled with Master Mold and not using um, not using Magneto. Gamora also struggles against those bigger allies, which Master Mold has a lot of. These uh, Mark 8s are incredibly dangerous. So after this minion engages you, attach the topmost Sentinel attachment from the discard pile to this minion. And he has, he's a 3-3-8. I mean, he's another villain. And the the attachments are going to give plus to stats. It's going to give retaliate. It's going to prevent extra health. Seeing those, I think I saw four of them in one game, and it was just like, that was horrible. Master Mold is too easy for me to enjoy with the Magneto ally, so played as intended, not such a fan. I think it's a much help. I think it's too much help, at least in my experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what I was trying to... Rush is easy, control is hard. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because he has super low health, so Rush makes it does make it sound easy. Um and the control is tough because those minions are so big. Like it it was such a it was such a swing between leadership, my game with Gamora leadership, we had no issues. We didn't see like any of the sentinels and we took them down in 3 turns. Then if we consistently saw some of these Mark 8s, we were running into some major issues. We were running into hour-long games, slog, slugfest, that we were just having a hard time. Now, I was not using the Magneto Ally. It was just sitting there, um, which 
Magneto, I wish they had brought Magneto's power level a little bit down, and then I think it would have been a lot more interesting of a scenario. Flip build heroes will struggle without Magneto. Yeah, yeah, yep, because, yeah, yeah, because he, if you flip down, he's he's bringing out a minion, and that can be so brutal. Groot would be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Groot would not enjoy uh, Master Mold whatsoever. Um, So let's rank them. Master Mold, I'm going to I'm going to throw him into these are villains in the game. That he is a villain in the game. He's probably not something that I'm going back to that frequently. He's either too easy or maybe a little too not hard but swingy if you're not using that Magneto ally. And so I'm going to throw him in these are villains in the game. We're going to drop him. We're going to drop him behind Mysterio. But in front of Nebula. He's he's a villain in the game. He's a middle of the road villain of the game. There you go. That's Master Mold. But good news is, is we got more villains to talk about. And next up is Mansion Attack. I like Mansion Attack a lot. Mansion Attack is really cool. Um, Mansion Attack is a scenario that there are four different uh, villains. And each villain activates differently. But you're only fighting one of them at a time. So you got Blob, Avalanche, Pyro, and Toad. And each one of these does a different thing when they attack you. So Toad, I think, is the worst at the beginning of the game. Because you're discarding cards randomly from your hand. And then also they have different side schemes. The different side schemes affect the characters. So like the Atrium is a game steady. And then if there are three main schemes in the victory display, the players lose the game. You start with one. So you do get, if you lose two, seven schemes you lose the game uh there can be some strategic decisions in losing the scheme though because the atrium each character gains steady then you may not like that as much as the courtyard where every character gets plus one attack if you can get the side scheme that benefits your strategy more than the villains you probably want to keep it on that but if you get like each character gets retaliate one and you're someone who's doing a lot of ping damage you probably are more apt to let that uh scheme out and hopefully draw into a better one for your strategy. Huge fan of Mish Mansion Attack. Always a different experience and good amount of minion side schemes and activations. Always something interesting going on. Yeah. Ma uh, sorry. Uh, BB, Master Mold is probably a good villain for Hulk. Apologetics. <laughs> nice. Mis just don't bring Mystique. Mystique is such a pain. Yep. Totally agree. I Yeah. I think... I and Mystique is not required in this scenario. However, the Brotherhood is, and there's an interesting um, mechanic that whenever you defeat one of these villains, in expert mode it's three, you have to defeat three of these, uh, to save the school, then you look and deal each player an encounter card. If a minion shares the same name as the villain, you discard the minion and the villain activates against you. And so there's uh, there's some like reason to clear some of the the minions before you push and i i think that's always a fun fun encounter to have management attack is good but i wish they made the side schemes trigger an ability to change the main that that would have been cool i think that would yeah that that would be really cool i never thought about that but i would really like that i really i would really like that that if you could somehow manipulate and bring in a different like go fight in a different area of the school that'd be cool that'd be really really cool i like that idea a lot brant Hmm. Um, yeah, so each character gains steady, each ally and minion gains toughness. The The hardest thing for me is I forget these stupid benefits. I don't know why. I can just never remember these benefits um, until someone yells at me on stream. Not yells at me, but reminds me on stream. Um, yeah, I, 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 I enjoy Mansion Attack a lot. I like the, I like the increase in difficulty for expert mode i think it's i think it's just good brotherhood beatdown is also a really cool card so when revealed for each of the following enemies in play uh you take a benefit or a detriment and that could be the minion as well so if you flip into a toad and you're facing off blob you flip a brotherhood beatdown you would look at blob you're stunned and then toad you discard a random card from your hand so you do really want to get rid of those minions because there are multiple things that can just be horrible for you and apparently there are nine of them <laughs> they're only three they're only three but wouldn't it be hard to make the scheme start at eight cap at 14 and if you get them to zero you change oh i like that that's a 
I mm. I think the only problem that we would run into at that is once you get to a scheme that you enjoy fighting at, um, then you would you would thwart it like to one and just never and just keep it. What you could do is if you defeat a villain, when you defeat a villain, you rotate the scheme at that point. That would be kind of interesting too, because like you're fighting Avalanche, you beat Avalanche, and then you go fight Toad in the cafeteria or something. So, like, there's also something that forces you to switch, so you can't just gamify it like that. But you do have the option to thwart it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. That'd be, yeah. Cool. I'm, I, there's so much flexibility that this game has in their design. I'm so excited for the future. Uh, because they have shown so much creative design in these last couple of boxes that I, I'm so pumped to see where we go. I'm so pumped. So tier maker, I am gonna throw mansion attack as an always excited to get this on the table. We're gonna throw it all the way up here at the top. Eh, there we go, perfect. So I like mansion attack. Mansion attack is also a really good one to test decks out against because it throws pretty much everything at you. So you get to see how a hero can handle anything that gets thrown at you. And yeah, mansion attack is mansion attack is a ton of fun. Can't wait for Kingpin. That's an improved hood. Oh, yeah. That'd be fun. That'd be really fun. Ah, uh, yeah. There's so... There, I bought this. I don't know if it's going to focus on it. It's like the Marvel Encyclopedia. And it's just like... I don't know how many pages it is. 500 or so pages. And it just breaks down like every like Marvel character or Marvel thing. And just... It's like an encyclopedia. Oh, it's the Marvel Encyclopedia. But I'm just thumbing through it, and there are so many, there's so many characters in the Marvel Universe, and so many things with, like, really cool ideas that I'm excited to see implemented into the game. Alrighty. Let's talk Capstone Villains. Not necessarily one last time, but Capstone Villains of a campaign one last time. Magneto. Brant, I'll go back and watch it, but what was the take on Thanos? Too easy, too hard, stalwart is dumb. Um, so Thanos is down there only played if randomly selected um, I don't like yeah stalwart stalwart is printed stalwart is dumb that was one of the big things and also I just don't like how Thanos feels very linear where it's a slugfest can you deal more than you can take there's there's you cannot stun um, the infinity gauntlet he just hits for a lot and you need to hit him for a lot and he's just a slugfest that I don't enjoy yeah. Magneto. Cool, cool, thanks. Yeah. Magneto is the capstone villain of the Mutant Genesis box. Magneto is tough. Magneto is not easy. I think Magneto's fun. I enjoy Magneto. I think he's one of the um he I'm trying to think. He's We have Ultron, Red Skull, uh, Loki, Ronin. Mag Magneto is top three. Well, yeah, I mean, two of the Capstone villains are. I'd actually like to kill them, but Magneto, I think, is fun. I think, I think they did a good job with Magneto as the Capstone villain. I think that there were a couple of issues with how his thing reads, and now you know this is you remove the magnet counters until before you do the magnetic card which you know fixed the infinite loop of just killing yourself um villain theory magneto is your favorite final villain in a box really enjoyed him i think he's a bit like what loki should have been lots going on challenging but fair he's not swingy he's just high tempo and that and he has high hp without having too much yeah yeah excellent and i also think that uh magneto i i did like the magneto challenge where i played every single X-Men against Magneto, expert Magneto in the different aspects. And the more I played Magneto, the more I enjoyed Magneto because you could, you could figure out and you learned his deck and it wasn't super swingy. And there are times that it was strategic to lose that main scheme because those magnet counters come off and it's just, but they get 
place back. I, it's just, oh, it's so good. It, I like Magneto a lot. He, he is very tough. He's not someone that I'm pulling out every single time. He's not, I, I am excited to get him onto the table, but I'm not excited to get him onto the table every, every single time. Fair is the biggest takeaway for me. Do you think Magneto is beatable without stun confused? Uh, um, that's a good question. He's a lot harder. Uh, in solo, maybe not. Um, the 12 Sentinels in his deck doesn't help. <laughs> Depends on the hero. Yeah, like, yeah, so the, like, Wolverine could probably, I, I don't know. I don't know. Stun and Confuse is really good because it prevents those magnet counters being added. That's an interesting question. Wolverine can beat it with sound, without sounding confused. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. I do really like the story that it tells. The boarding party into, uh, all right, it's, yeah, I think it's boarding party into sabotage master mold into orbital decay. So these are side schemes. Whenever you thwart them down, uh, you move on to the next one. Magneto cannot uh, have more than six uh, sustained damage, twelve, and then eighteen, and then he has steady until you defeat orbital decay, and then he loses steady. I think that's an awesome mechanic i think that's really cool where it's it's not stalwart but it you once you kind of like force him to be under physical strain then he loses steady he loses his focus and you can stun and confuse him i think that's cool uh villain theories beat him without stun and confuse obviously depends on the deck and hero. i've done it with storm protection on expert on standard on expert nice uh the way he i like the way he loses steady yeah yeah i it's so cool. It's such good design. I love it. And it's not easy. Yeah, he's definitely not easy. Um, I hate this card. Nope. This card. I hate this card. When Magneto would take any amount of damage, place it here instead. Then if there are eight or more damage here, discard this card. I, I And he gives Retaliate one. I do not like that card. I That card is very frustrating to me. Especially because there's not another way to get rid of it. Now, if this had like... You know, spend one of each resource to get rid of it. That would be a, a little bit better. But, yeah. I think this is a cool card. Magnetic Missile is a cool card. Surges, defeat a Sentinel Minion, then take five damage. And you can discard five cards from your... Or X cards from your hand to prevent that much damage. I think that's a really cool design. I think that's fun. Uh, Brant on Expert. I've only beat him on Expert with Wolverine and Captain Marvel, but I haven't played him that much. Nice. Yeah. Mag Magneto is... I don't think he beats out Red Skull for me. I don't think he beats out Ultron for me. I yeah, I think he may be in my top five. Especially with the fixes. Especially with some of the fixes that they made. Where he went from being one of my favorite villains to play against to one of my least favorite villains to play against once I realized that this magnetic card could just kill you. Right? Because the way that it reads is you... Discard cards until you get a magnetic card. Some of those magnetic cards add mag magnet counters, and then you would resolve another one, and then you would resolve another one, and then another one. And then they ruled it that you remove the three, then discard until you get a magnet card. So that made this still very difficult. But I do, if you played it rules as written when it came out, it could. I mean, it would it would almost be impossible if you go into like this. So like exhaust each upgrade and support, place one magnet, which would trigger the force response again. So that that when they fixed that, it got a lot it got a lot better. Because then if you go into metal shards, deal one damage for each character you control, place one, surges again. So it just it Yeah, yeah, they 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 updated the rule. They updated the rule. So you remove the magnet counters, then you resolve the card. Always played it as the fix, yeah. And and that's how I played it. That's how it I think it was supposed to be intended. And then it was on one of my streams where I realized that I was like, this is not good. Because if you place a magnet counter on the from this magnetic card, it triggers that force response again because they have not been removed. I was like, this is not fun. I don't want to play this anymore. Um, but they 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 did update it. So let's uh let's go over here to the tier maker. I'm gonna drop I'm gonna drop Magneto in here. Um, I like him more or less than I think I like him less. So that's gonna bump Kang down to always get excited on hit the table. So our current top five look like Hella, Red Skull, Ultron, um, Sentinel, and Master or Wow, uh, Magneto. I I think this is hilarious. Our capstone villains are either in the top 
or in the bottom, right? So we have Loki and Ronin down here, and Red Skull, Ultron, uh, Magneto here. I'm missing one. Venom Goblin's here. But, like, it, it, there's just... I either love them or I hate them. <laughs> that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of interesting. I never thought about it that way. And then Venom Goblin's over here by himself. I feel like I was a little... Just how this is shaping up. I typically think that these should follow somewhat of a normal distribution. And it looks like I was a little skewed towards liking them more. Right? So I feel like this should be the most... This should have a couple... But it's it's fine. <laughs> I'm not getting graded on this. My stats professor is not grading me on this. Alrighty. So that's going to move us into the last box that we are taking a look at today. Which is the Mojo Mania scenario pack the mojo media scenario pack i think is the best scenario pack out there i really like the mini campaign style of the scenario packs i really like what they've been doing with scenario packs i think it's a cool way for them to flex creative skills and make encounters for people that are not necessarily uh are make encounters for hardcore followers of the game right i think scenario packs are probably some of their least performing product but i think it there's some of their most creative design and so with that, I'm really happy with what Mojo put out. So Mojo is the three scenario campaign consisting of Magog, Spiral, and Mojo. And each one of them plays a little bit differently. Also, I need to say this before we talk about the specific villains. The encounter sets that came in this, I adore. The, the thematic TV set encounter sets are so cool. Because there's like the crime, there's the fantasy, and they all lean into different, one, they're punny, and then two is, they're just cool, they're just good, they're just good encounter sets. They're so good. I love throwing them into, well, Mojo, but just also anything else. Villain Theory, Mojo Mania is a smash hit as far as I'm concerned. It's not perfect, but I don't think they aim for perfect, they aim for fun, and they got it. Yes, 100%. Magog is up first. I think Magog is the weakest in the box. I... Like what they were going for Magog, I think, uh, what is it? Expert Magog is a little overcranked. Maybe? Wait, hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the way that Magog works is you're, like, in this arena and you're facing off against Magog and, like, his posse and you're trying to win over the crowd. So, it's a really cool, like, idea and implementation so there's the champions and the challengers so whenever you get to 10 raid encounters on the challengers you've won the crowd over you win the game um if you get if the champion gets 10 raid encounters then magog wins over the crowd and magog wins the game there are different ways to get counters but mainly it's if you scheme out on the main you place two raid encounters on the champion making him stronger and then if you um kill magog um, if you reduce his hit points, then you place raid encounters on the challengers, deal each player face down encounter cards, and then reset his hit points. So it's like you knock him out, and then he like gets back up, but you've won over a little bit of momentum with the crowd. Really, really cool design. Um, and when I say he's the weakest in the box, I still really like Magog. I think, um, what is it? If he, after my talking attacks and damages the character, place one raid encounter, and then an expert, after he attacks, place two raid encounters on the champion, that gets really tough. Um, I think, Brant, you were saying um, Magneto without Sun and Confuse. Expert Magog without Sun or Confuse, I think, is one of the harder ways to play. The other way you could approach it is maybe like a flipping hero, but attacks and damage as a character. I feel like Groot would actually be really good against Magog now that I'm thinking about it, just because he can soak all that damage. But, I mean... It's tough. Two raid encounters after you take a damage and you cannot chump block because of that. That's tough. Magog is your favorite of the three. Oh, nice. Okay. But due to delays in the UK, I haven't got as many plays on these villains as you'd like. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I like Magog a lot. I think it's really cool. Whenever you flip the champion, so it starts on the booing crowd. If there's at least five, you flip. And then um, when the champion flips... Everyone gets to draw a card. When the challengers flips, you get to bring in the surprise contender, which is a villainous one, two, seven per health. And then after he attacks and damages the character, place one ratings on the champion. And then when you defeat him, you get to place ratings on the challengers. So it's it's a really cool flow. It's a really cool story. Um, yeah. 
I like it. I, li I like it a lot. Um, when we go over to ranking him, I'm going to throw him in the always excited to get this onto the table. <clears throat> I may be suffering from a little bit of new bias here because he is, or the, this, uh, these are the newest villains in the game. Like Villain Theory, I have not gotten a lot of chance to play them. And so I typically just enjoy newer stuff more. That's just maybe human nature, but definitely my nature. Um, let's drop him in behind Ebony Maw. So we're going to go always excited to get him onto the table right behind Ebony Maw. So I, I think I'm happy with that. Magog feels like a really cool... Uh, scenario but an expert he's tough an expert he's tough an expert because he ramps up those counters so quickly because he's swinging for he's swinging for three and if he damages a character you control and so I do think protection works pretty well against him so that was fun alrighty two more next up we've got spiral spiral is my favorite out of the in the box spiral is um a spiral is a villain that is kind of hiding from you so you kind of get out of the magog scenario and you're hiding from Sp or spirals hiding from you, you're trying to get to her and she cannot take damage until you have cornered her and the way that that works is you have i think three encounter sets that you shuffle into the spiral pack and then their environments in those encounter sets get shuffled into with this cornered card and whenever you thwart down the permanent side scheme the search for spiral then you get to uh, change out the environment card with the next card if that is the corner then you get to flip spiral over and uh, you can then damage her and so it's a really cool like kind of rope or a tug of war trying to find spiral and then dealing enough damage before she flips over after she activates you place one counter on her if there's three counters she goes back away and you have to find her again really cool scenario the these spiral swords are insane though uh so three sword counters she gets plus one for each sword counter on this card if spiral is on her cornered side spend two physical resources to remove one sword counter from this card that is brutal. That is absolutely brutal. She's not attacking unless she's on her corner side. And then when she would attack, she schemes instead. So there is some, there's a lot of threat mitigation because you need to be thwarting down this. You can also take two damage to remove three threat, which is cool. The swords. Yeah, the swords are insane. The swords are so bad. <laughs> um, especially because there's two of them, right? So she can come in here and be swinging for plus six if you, if you don't take care of the swords. Um... Yeah, not good, not good. But like your your visions and your shadow cats and stuff are are pretty good because I think you can just discard them, right? Yeah, I think a vision a vision can just discard the spiral swords. So same with the shadow cat. I played this in Nova and it was so much fun. It was a little dumb because you were able to unleash the Nova force and you could always kill this side scheme. Right, because you can take two damage to remove three threat from here, reducing it to zero, meaning that you get to ready Nova and draw a card. So an Unleash the Nova Force turn against Spiral is some of the most busted, incredibly fun things that you can do in the game. And so that's a lot of fun. Sunfire discards them too, otherwise they're a nightmare. Yeah, ooh, Sunfire is a good... Yeah, yeah, Sunfire is good. I, I like Spiral. I like what she has... Um, I like what she makes you do. She also forces you to or she she requires three different side schemes or three different modular sets and you are seeing those environments of those mod sets which alter the game state significantly so every single time you sit down with her you get a different you get completely different uh experience because you could go crime fantasy and western and that's going to be different than a western crime sitcom right all you have to do is switch out one of them and it can be very very differently different and you have to figure out how you're going to lean into which one of the environments works best and how you're going to find spiral it's oh it's so good it's so good i love this scenario i love this it's uh, cool okay so let's let's go over to our tier maker i'm gonna oh my goodness do i like her more than magneto i don't think i do i'm gonna put her up here in front of kang though 
She she's I I think she is so good. I think she is so much fun. She provides a lot of challenge. It's a I really like I really like her design. I was I don't think I like her more than Magneto though, but she she's close to that top 5. Close to that top 5. All righty. It's time for the final villain, Mojo. Mojo is interesting. Mojo is I don't know. I I I think I like Mojo more than Magog. But they are right about the same for me. Mojo is a lot of health. 16, 18, 25. And schemes out of 25. Um, but after your turn ends, discard the top three cards you the encounter deck. Place one threat in your hero for each card. That way it does not belong to the Mojo encounter set. So you're adding in different encounter sets. And then there's an alternate loss condition that if you deck out multiple times, you lose the game. Um, so choose one modular set plus one modular set per player. And so you have two modular sets in a solo game. And then once you deck out, um, you add, where is it? Um, uh, yeah. So at the start of step three, deal and counter cards randomly cho choose one set aside modular set and reveal a show environment. Shuffle the rest of that modular set and place it on the top of the encounter deck. Deal the first player two face down encounter cards and flip this card. Um, and then if the, after the encounter deck resets, if there are no set aside modular encounter sets remaining, the players lose the game. So you cannot necessarily stall. And that makes it hard because you need to go through a significant amount of health quickly, which is kind of fun. I like how you put, put threat onto other characters with him. So unique. Yeah. Yeah. And so how, what happens there? Um, when reveal, place two threat on each friendly character, and then whenever that character dies or whenever that character flips, if it's like a hero, then you move that threat to the main scheme. So there's other ways of adding threat to this main scheme outside of just like the four scheme. And so it, it, it does force you to approach the game differently. And that is, that's really cool. And I appreciate how they did that. Um, I think it's cool how they have the wheel of genres in here. Um, there are a couple, I didn't realize that there are a couple of them, like clowns and war. I wonder if we'll ever get those. I'm just now noticing that, right? Like you got romance. I don't think we have a romance, musical, clowns, war. Those are on the wheel that we don't actually have in the game. Not. So that'd be kind of cool if we got those. Um, mm. Yeah. So... Final ranking for Mojo. Let's go ahead and put Mojo. I'm going to put Mojo. I like him better than Magog. I'm going to put. I'm going to put Mojo right there next to Magog. I think. Yeah. I think that this is some of the best villain content that we've seen in the entire game. It's such a good. It's such a good pack. I would highly recommend you pick it up. If not, if you don't, if the encounters don't sound interesting to you at all, um, then that's a little surprising. But also, just the mod sets are probably worth the twenty bucks or whatever it was. The mod sets are very, very solid. But there you go. Those are all the villains in the game, from Hella to Collector One, my favorite to my least favorite. We got the top five being Hella, Red Skull, Ultron, uh, Project Wide Awake, and Magneto. Villain Theory, thanks so much for the stream, Nelson. Really enjoyed it. Well, thank you for joining. I appreciate it. And I was happy to, I was excited to hear what you had to say. And thank you for the subscription with Amazon Prime. Thank you so very much. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Yeah, that makes me happy. What a good way to end a stream. That's so fun. Okay, so, hey, BB, thank you for the stream. Thank you for joining. Alrighty, so... I am going to be on a little bit of a break. I got some vacation coming up, and so we will not be streaming for the next two weeks. I do have content planned for almost every single day out of those two weeks on YouTube. So um, if you need Marvel or if you need LCG content, don't worry, there's going to be some. But we will be coming back towards the end of February. We'll get a couple streams in, and then we get Gambit and Rogue. We're going to get to dive into Gambit and Rogue. And so I'm so excited. I. I'm so excited for Gambit. Rogue looks kind of interesting, but I'm I'm so very pumped for Gambit. We're going to be doing a lot of streams. We're going to get to play them, do their hero spotlights, and then dive in and see what they got. 
Nathan Germany, you have a nice time, bro. Thank you so very much. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Um, it means a lot, and I appreciate all of you. I will talk to you a little soon, and have some fun playing some Marvel Champions. See you around. Peace. We'll be right back.